All right, I am here with Eric Viertaler, and as a last minute surprise guest, we have the brilliant and unflappable and ever lovely Erica the Gutstick Given with us. So yeah. say hello. Uh, and uh, what? Which one of those things were you going to take issue with, Erica? <laughs> All three. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> un un unflappable. That's you said that, right? Yes. I think I'm unflappable. You seem yeah, to be. I'm, I'm hard to I'm hard to irritate, I think. Well, I mean, you managed to keep your cool with Nathan Thompson, so you've ba you, you've yeah, you've run the gauntlet on that one. You're you're good. Unflappable Listen, is. <laughs> oh, and that's and on top of that, I also am highly, highly impressed, like that you actually were able to get G Man to be calm. I mean, you, you got G Man out of all people to be calm. Don't give me complete credit on that. I was told G-Man was also on his best behavior that night. And and I actually had a lovely time with G-Man. I really did. He's yeah. he's a fun person yeah. to talk to. <laughs> I, I actually had fun too, which was surprising. And as I told him, I was, you know, I was honest about it. But anyway, <clears throat> we are here to watch um, a, a, what was a live streamed tour of a section of the Glendive Fossil Museum, which is a young earth creationist museum featuring well fossils. Um, one quick note is <clears throat> there is a miner who appears in the video and I have censored his face and removed audio of his name. And because of his presence, I am also not linking to the original. If you want to hunt it down, it is publicly available. But out of uh, both concern for monetization as well as possible legal ramifications, as well as just I don't want this to be something that comes back to haunt this kid in 15 to 20 years. So for all of those reasons, there ha I spent the morning making sure that this kid's face didn't appear, nor did his name actually appear audibly. I'm pretty sure I got it. If I didn't, well, I'm sorry, kid, whose name I'm not going to say. So that is it. <clears throat> is everyone ready for us to get going with this tour? Dapper, please do tell us where this tour is, and Eric, give oh, us some right. background Actually, on on your relationship uh, with it. Yeah, let's let's hear let's hear Eric give that story. Go ahead, Eric. Okay, so some of you might know it's because of when I did my own episode of Leaving YEC. So this was the same museum that I went to as much as I could when I was a YEC. So this museum is located three hours away from where I live. And so, and then on all of my drives there and all my drives back, I always would listen to Ken Hovind and, uh, and yeah. And so, um, so yeah, this is a place I have very, very, very fond memories with. And to be fair, it actually looks like it does have a lot of cool specimens in there. I'm not going to lie. I, I've, of course, to censor this uh, video, I had to watch it like 18 million times. So, <laughs> Yeah, but of course, the context of some of it, we would definitely say is very, very inaccurate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a kind way of putting it. <laughs> it yeah. is. I'm, I'm ready. I think I, I think this is quite relevant as well. You, the, the Glendive Fossil Museum is located quite close to the, uh, well, what's it, uh, Otis Klein e Creationist Ranch, where mm -hmm. we find quite a few of our more recent, more incredulous soft tissue finds. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. ones that are just like, mm, is that real or is it is it fake? I guess we can't check. That's the Otis Klein awesome. Ranch is home of excellent methodology, of course. Oh my goodness. Funny that you, you mentioned Otis Klein is because he actually was the one, because he actually was the one who founded this museum. Oh, that makes yeah. sense. Wait, is that Otis there himself on the left? Because I don't know who that is. Uh, as far as my understanding goes, uh, Otis retired. It was it, it, it was just because of his age. Uh, um, so the person on the left is the one who took his spot. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I think I think think that's correct. I don't. I pulled up yeah. some Otis Klein picks, and I don't think that's him. No. Okay. Yeah. 
Definitely um, not. I'm also sorry about the relatively low quality of this video, but this is the highest resolution that was available to me, so... Gotta do what yeah, gotta do. They, they apparently filmed this with a potato, so... Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, <Potato. laughs> uh, Vandalia1998 for $1.99 says, Did you see any of your family in the vid, Daffer? A uh, distant family. No no ceratosaurus as specimens that I saw. But uh, other Morrison uh, fauna are in in this uh, this museum. But we'll we'll see we'll get to that shortly. Good morning and welcome back to our live virtual tour of the Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum. Why don't you say hi? Oh, and just quickly because Rufus has to leave. Rufus the Hunal Prophet. For two dollars American says hi just giving you a gift although I can't stay thank you very much Rufus you have a good day and uh, hey come back whenever you want um, you know hop on the discord channel we're, we're, we're around so uh, I hope you are having a good day and you stay safe oh and it reminds me I do know some of my audience is celebrating Easter tomorrow so if oh, yeah? you are celebrating Easter tomorrow happy Easter and I'm sorry that it's going to be such a weird quarantine Easter but uh, I do happen to know that at least a few of my viewers are celebrating tomorrow and not last week. Because in case people don't know, <laughs> next week is what's often in the United States referred to as Greek Easter. But it's really just Eastern Orthodox date for Easter. And for $2.01, taking the high spot, <laughs> Beethoven says $194 to go, which is true. The next Dapper Tutu video is in $194 if we get to it on this stream. <laughs> 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 so here we go. Hey, everybody. Let's get there. rocking. Hi. All right. Well, we are glad to have you back and joining us here. We ended our time on Tuesday with our entryway area. And we want to now just kind of review what we did and give people a chance to get on live. A couple of quick reminders. You can go to our webpage at creationtruth.org and you can... Uh, print off the Junior Paleontology Worksheet, and then when we get all done with our tour through the museum, you can send us information that you've completed it, and we will send you out one of our nice little Junior Paleontologist buttons. Now, see, this is actually, that phrase right there is one of the reasons I left this beginning bit in here. It, it bugs me a little bit that they're giving kids the impression that this is a... a, a in any way going to be educational about paleontology, except in the barest idea of recognizing a few fossil taxa on site in the form of yeah. relatively complete reconstructions. I, I have pulled up the creationtruth.org junior paleontologist activity book in the background so that I can mentally fill it out for myself. Yeah. Well, he, got, he does go through it fairly, fairly thoroughly, because, like I said, I, I now feel like I have most of this video memorized, having watched it to censor the kid's face, because, yeah. oh my goodness. Because, as you'll notice, I, I made sure the little censor thing moves around and everything. It's not just static. I do a good job for you guys. All right. Yeah, and, yeah, and uh, one more thing before we go back to playing it. And so, um, by him telling them at a very young age, like, the, oh, this is real science and whatnot, Later on, when they go off to college, when they actually learn the real, real science of it, I can guarantee you like that, that kid is going to go, oh, well, shoot. Um, I think, think I might have to surrender my uh, faith now, which is, which is one of the main reasons why that, uh, a, lot, a lot of people do abandon their faith. And so, and so what he's doing right now he is actually setting him up, like for some time in the future, for him to potentially lose his faith. Oh, and by the way, uh, my newest patron has joined this, the chat. Speed of sound of gravity, <laughs> welcome. Thank you for joining the team. Uh, I'm going to be putting your name oh. in the uh, next credit scene that I do. Also, for two dollars from Beach Eight, thanks, Dapper and Eric. Erica, you're amazing. Uh, you're amazing. What? Permit? Oh, no, I'm just making a spelling joke. Um, also, we have, from Ugly German Truths, why does the stream have a Warhammer 40k motif? I don't know. It just seemed fun to me. So I did it. Let, let me, let me uh, jump in here with just some, a fun fact about this uh, Glendive Dinosaur and Fossil Museum website. 
they have an about us section and the entirety of the about us section can be summarized in in several statements that they give that are you know, essentially amounts to, to creationist mantras uh things like everything being supernaturally created in the beginning whatever in six days the, the you know the classic stuff but then sandwiched in the middle and in, in what seems very out of place they have a line that says marriage is ordained by god and it's only between one man and one woman which i think is just just kind of like unnecessarily strange and shoehorned uh but we get it we we get it you know the the the, the gay the gay folks aren't allowed at the glendale hey that's <laughs> not traditional well, that's not traditional ceratosaurus marriage stop being a tradition okay. bigot or something i don't know i i got nothing i'm sorry yeah it's it's a weird thing to put into the thing because it's just like how does this relate but i guess that's mm. a thing that a lot of uh especially particularly fundamentalist evangelical protestant uh groups are do are putting in their statements whether or not it seems to apply but they also might have it in there just so that um when they hire someone and say that they have to abide by the statement of faith they can fire them if they violate that part yeah yeah it's it's yeah it just seems kind of yeah it's out of place for for it's for it's sort of statement of belief i suppose but you're right it it lays the groundwork just in case <laughs> right i'm i'm sure it's literally there to help them discriminate against employees who aren't going to follow their sexual mores yeah at at the very worst absolutely at the very least it's just in poor taste i think yeah yeah, yeah i kind of think so too and you know and if they're going to do that well and then they can go right ahead. Well, they can go right ahead and uh, argue with all the pastors and other believers, like who are gay or whatnot. But that's a completely separate topic, though. <laughs> also, for four ninety nine from Vandalia nineteen ninety eight. That's uh, four ninety nine US. He says this Eric with Erica seems much smarter than the last one you hosted. I think that's because of the Eric. <laughs> the, the Eric in this one is a much smarter Eric. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is funny, which is funny, it was because somebody said after my last debate with Ken Holvin, someone said, hey, because he has a son named Eric, your name is Eric, and you debated his father, you should do him with the son. I don't think Eric Hovind <laughs> oh, really does debates, God. though. He does. I rarely, but yeah, but honestly, because of how rarely he ever does it, and he pretty much repeats the same things his father does, I kind of doubt that that whatever happened anyway yeah yeah hoven hoven jr is a lot less um inclined with the with the science stuff as well he's more of a philosophy guy it seems yeah which, he is uh, yeah well except that his philosophy is is at least as bad as his dad's science yeah. fair enough right that's the fair problem I mean, for, I mean for crying out loud ken hoven says that a chameleon is a is a modern day triceratops that that is he, That's so wrong on so many levels. Yeah, yeah. He, he particularly goes with a Jackson chameleon, which at some point he did acquire one for Dinosaur Adventureland. I don't know if it's still alive or if they still have it or what, but he showed it off on a video. But uh, yeah, if we were to if we were to list off all of the misconceptions that we've heard Kent Hovind Senior say, we would be here all day. That's true. Yeah. Which, which we can't be because I also have to teach Erica how to go live on her channel. So that's another thing we have to do I'm, today. <laughs> I'm nervous about that. <laughs> oh, you'll be you'll be fine. And by the way, we have yet another super chat for 199 US from Kakarot. How do some or sorry, how do people still believe in creationism? Well, it's look at this kid. This is all he's being taught. That's how. Well, not only that too, but I think for some people, I watched I I watched two things on Standing for Truth's channel last night. He hosted two separate debates, one between himself and Conspiracy Cats on genetics, and one between Mark Tristale and Jason Maddox. And I was watching the second one with, with Mark and Jason, and I realized that for guys like Jason, it, it, they start with the philosophical basis of, like, how can something come from nothing, you know, quote unquote, mm -hmm. and then they work backwards from there. So anything that doesn't fit that that sort of preset philosophical basis mm -hmm. is looked at from an angle of incredulity, um, okay. like right off the bat. And and it all comes down to, oh, you know, how could it happen by chance? It's an abiogenesis conversation, basically. Okay. Um, and and I think that that's something that that as people who try to communicate good science, we have to keep in mind. 
you know, is that it's like, it's not always, although it is quite frequently rooted in bad science, sometimes it can be rooted in another place entirely, in which case we leave, I would personally leave, leave that conversation up to somebody who knows their philosophy better than I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, um, <clears throat> uh, Eric and Erica's channels are linked in the description. However, if you got here before the stream started, by more than 10-ish minutes, you might have to refresh to make sure Erica's is in there, because when I initially set up the stream, Erica's <laughs> presence wasn't part of the plan. This is a this is a, a late addition. I think I asked you, what, yesterday? I think you asked me this morning. Oh, well, this morning and yesterday are basically the same time. My sleep schedule is completely ruined. Oh, mine is too. Mine is trash. I, right. I got up at noon and went to bed at five, so... I'm oh, goodness. Looking. All right, here we go. I have two of them. You have, you have two of them? You're hoarding them. Okay, I see how it is. So, it is going to help us, guide us through the junior paleontology portion. And we will be here every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. And you can join us right here on our Facebook page as well. So, thank you for joining us. Welcome back. A couple quick reminders is we present our exhibits in the context of biblical history. And that means we believe the Bible is an accurate history of the world, and that what what how do we think that the the fossils got here? Flood. The flood, yeah. So we're going to talk about that, and they are going to talk about that, and it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. I guarantee no, it. No. Yeah, we're starting with the colossal sized yikes. Yeah, because the flood explains literally none of the geological evidence of Earth. It's... I mean, yeah, I mean, some rocks were flooded, but every rock, yeah, no. And also, and he also is trying to equivocate young earth creationism, I like with all of Christianity, which I mean, I mean, Christianity is completely compatible with evolution, like with theistic evolution, there's also old earth creationism, like with Hugh Ross's route, and so... And uh, and also, and as far as my understanding goes, Young Earth creationism is one of the more recent branches of it. Yeah. Also, we have an, an amusing uh, thing in chat here. Icarus says, a wild Erica appears. She used live stream. It was very effective. <laughs> <laughs> no, right now, if I used live stream as a move, the answer would be, and it failed. That's, my attack would fail. Also, like guillotine or fissure does <laughs> also speed of sound of gravity says my cat loki loves the dapper dino he watches the whole video that's why i became a patreon awesome well <laughs> thank your cat for me i appreciate that here we well let's let's hit play and see where else we go this is only a 27 minute video so i think we can actually get through it why the it's optimistic is, is mm. the explanation for the fossils being here so let's let's just kind of review a little bit who is this dan dan how do you get his name from a person who was named Stan from North Dakota. From well, it was South Dakota. Yeah, good. That's that's close. South Dakota, and that is how he got his name. And we we talked a little bit about Stan. And Stan is a cast of the original skeleton, original skeletons in Hill City, South Dakota. So let's make our way over here. Talk about a couple things right here. A bunch of stuff right up here. And we can talk about these things. We have oh, one thing I want to point out is the audio will cut out whenever the kid's name was used. So there will be weird audio bits. That's why. I just want to point that out. I opted not okay. to go with like the one kilohertz beep tone just because some people find that tone um, unpleasant. So I just went with silence. So there will be audio bits. Okay. We have some real bone here in our glass case. So come over here and stand by me so the kids online and everybody online can see those bones. Some of the different bones from an Edmontosaurus, Triceratops. Something I forgot to mention was that the way Edmontosaurus got its name was the... So are we looking at, what, an Edmontosaurus? Well, we've got a Triceratops. What is that, the distal end of a femur? I believe so. Okay. And then, I, is that a humerus on that Edmontosaurus? I think it is. Um, I do have photos of... Of those same fossils on my phone from all the times that I went there. So if I were to look at my phone, I could tell you, but I would have to scroll way back. What do you what do you, what are you guessing there, Erica? I'm I'm guessing humorous, but I don't I don't know. No, I think that's a fair guess just based off of how it tapers. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I so. I would like to make a guess about the thing in the cast up up top, but like my microphone is in the way, and no matter which way I turn my head, I can't get a good look at it. So <laughs> I don't even know. But I looking over at the screen, I'm gonna say maybe Triceratops hu humorous. I think maybe, but uh, it's too small for me to see. And my like I said, my microphone's in the way, so I'm gonna give for, up. For the the cast at the very top. Mm -hmm. I think a humorous would be fair because you can see kind of your your little um, uh, sockets on the right, my right, I guess. I'm not sure which if it's if it's the same for you guys, but where your radius and your ulna would right. notch in there. Oh, and for one ninety nine from Kakarot, we have Hovind is still using the Eco Stones that AIG left. Yeah, they left those hard when it became super obvious that they were all the interesting ones, shall we say, were fake. There are real Eco Stones out there; they're actual artifacts, but none of them display UFOs or uh, dinosaurs or brain surgery. So yeah, the UFO one, the UFO one should have been the uh... <laughs> right <laughs> back. But these are bad arguments. Where where are the uh, UFOs in the back? Well, I guess you could say like the the bit in Ezekiel with the flying wheels and stuff. Some people have said that that's a UFO. Yeah. But also, I... yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, but uh, this is a point that I really want to get in. Um, so AIG has gone on to say, oh well, don't use the Ica stones, and they also have even said don't even use the Cambodian Stegosaurus carving. But yet recently, Bodhi Hodge actually did like a live stream on like the AIG uh, um, uh, YouTube channel. And he actually used the Cambodian carving when AIG has gone on to say, hey, don't use it. Hmm. Maybe he didn't get that memo. His father-in-law didn't pass that one along to him. But yeah. You, I mean, if you I mean, you, Saurus, really? Yeah, you've got creations out there still pointing to the Egyptian serpopod, serpopod, serpopods, something like that. They're, they're, they, they're supposed to be sauropod analogs right and and yeah. the head is is completely feline it's got whiskers and round ears mm -hmm. and and yeah. little blunted nose it's hmm. and spots on the neck i mean it, it blows my mind but yeah i digress I, uh, interesting i don't know of any sauropod that has whiskers on its face hmm. yeah well where, whiskers don't preserve no well so you know maybe but where are where are the, where is the pitting on the rostral end of the snout where is the pitting dapper <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, that's a good point. There isn't any. Well, there is, but it would be for cartilaginous bands, and it doesn't actually look like the pitting that you would see for whiskers. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. You know what, Erica? Stop Let's stomping on my dreams of feline sauropods. Location Listen, I would like it as much as anyone. You probably figure that out. Edmonton, <laughs> yeah. Alberta, Canada. So Edmontosaurus. And that is how that particular dinosaur got its name. It's a duck-billed variety. Up here... We've got our Allosaurus cast, and we have our Allosaurus model. And our Allosaurus model, what's its name? Do you remember? I told you. I didn't tell you last time, but... Um, Steve? Steve. It's named after Steve Hamilton, who was a children's pastor at Faithy Church in Billings, and uh, that is... I gotta say, it's way less impressive to have a model in a creationist museum named after you than it is to have an actual specimen of a T-Rex named after you. So... Yes. Also, where where is our where is our Sue representation? Where are our female model names? <laughs> um, I demand. <laughs> well, we've only had let me bring the hammer down. <laughs> well, okay. To be fair, if if we're just assuming random flip of the coin, like we're going to give it a male for a female name, the chances of two male n names in a row is you know twenty five percent. That's not exactly short odds. We, also, we need a bigger sample. I do think that our sample size of, of uh, you know, available male creationist scientists is quite a bit larger than our pool. I mean, we you'd have like six Georgias if if you were doing <laughs> <That's true. laughs> proper representation. Are, are, I, I, the only one I can think of is Georgia Purdom. Are, are there uh, any others that you know of? Yeah, Off the top of my head, no. Okay. I mean, I'm sorry, Eric. Go ahead. I interrupted yeah, you. I'm sorry. No, but I. I think that Georgia is just like the most uh, prominent one. I, I I mean, I'm sure that there are more that just aren't as well known as her, but maybe she's just the most well known out, out of all of them. I'm, maybe, but I'm having trouble thinking of a single person who 
actually does any work speaking or publishing for creationism other than like you know aig staff members they trot out every once in a while that aren't really significant in any intellectual way yeah like, what are the big names yeah like like uh there's the video series that i still have uploading it has like karina altman but she doesn't i mean she's the zookeeper for aig i don't right. i don't know that that counts but i mean you know uh let's see uh, Eric, uh, for 199 from Vandalia 1998, Erica, do you have a primate named after you yet? I wish. I don't think there are, there are going to be any discovered anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably not. Plus, you know, there is that rule that you don't get to name things after yourself. So someone else would have to be enamored enough of you to, to want, well, well, someone who finds a new primate, that's the first challenge. Then you'd have to have them be so enamored with you that they would name a primate after you. I know I need I need to tote out family members or significant others out with me to to give them credit so that they can <laughs> put my name in the speech. I think my only hope would be would be a subspeciation like, you know, there have been orangutans, obviously, have been known about for for all time, basically, that, that humans yeah. have been around. Um, but recently they did they did genetically determine that there was a subspecies, so there <clears> got to be a new subspecies name. That would be my only hope. Okay. Also, uh, Ugly German Truths point out, points out uh, Wendy Wright, who, yeah, you're right, I forgot about her. Uh, she did an interview with Dawkins yeah. and then very dishonestly edited it. But, um, yeah, so I guess Wendy Wright would count, too. So there we go. We, got two, we could have a whole museum full of Georgias and Wendy's. Just there we go. Georgia and Perfect. Wendy everywhere. That might get confusing, but... <laughs> All right, here we go. More, some more of this video. How he got his name. So, in our entryway, we see examples of casts of real bone and models as well. So, as we make our way over to this, over to this part of the museum, are you, should we just stay out here or should we go into the museum? Let's go into the museum. Okay, you excited? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you've seen the museum quite a bit, but it's still exciting to see. So let's make our way into our first room, and we're going to kind of walk over here. You'll stand right here, and we can talk a little bit about this particular exhibit. This is our C4 exhibit, and you can see down below you, we have a, a glass bridge that you can cross. And uh, we try to make it feel a little bit like you might be in water and, and you're going through the ocean. So this particular exhibit, many of the animals in here are, are found as fossils in what's called the Cambrian layer of the fossil record. One thing I just want to point out real quick is there isn't a Cambrian layer. There's a Cambrian period, so-called because it has lots of layers in it. <clears throat> and different formations. So the layers of the Cambrian aren't the same worldwide. It bugs me a little bit when you're just going to say there's a layer. Because first of all, there's more. <clears throat> sorry, there's more than one kind of layer. You can have strata. You can have laminate. You can have laminates. Laminate. Laminate. I don't know. Latin. Whatever. Plural of Latin. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. But um, yeah. So saying a Cambrian layer is a bit dishonest. But let's see what he has to say about the Cambrian. Before no. before you hit play, um, there was, I, if I'm correct, we got a brief look at a part of an anomalocaris on on the uh, on S his left. Spoilers, I Erica. Um, I know. I I don't know if they're going to show it or not, but uh, they will. Uh, It'll be highlighted. Wait, yeah. really? Oh Sweet. yeah. Uh, spoilers. <laughs> yeah, that is that really is spoilers. Actually, it's a, it's a very nice like. Uh, very, you can tell that a lot of work went into this. Like, it was not a lazily done effort. And it is actually a fairly nice Anomalocaris model. Um, it's very, yeah. very, it has a lot of artistic merit. So, Let's um, hurry up. I want to see it. Okay, okay. The fossil record is really the lowest layer that you really start finding a lot of fossils. There is a pre Cambrian layer, but the Cambrian layer is where a lot of animals start popping up. And so, the question we often ask is, so what do these animals all have in common? Um, are they all simple creatures? Which is what you would expect when it comes to an evolutionary way of thinking. Well, I, I would like to see what the, the panel members have to say about that, the answer to that question. Are they all simple? Uh, absolutely not. No, I wouldn't yeah. say so either. 
I would, however, say that they are all suspiciously basal, given the various uh, stem or crown groups to which they belong. I mean, to to, to get to simple, quote unquote, you're you're going back to before the Ediacaran. I mean, compared to the organisms that come before even the Ediacaran, you're you're starting to see segmentation and and sort of multicellular life that has never popped up before, at least that that we see in the fossil record. So it's it's mm-hmm. a bit disingenuous or uninformed to suggest that the, the Cambrian is is where we're finding the first simple life. But yeah, I guess you have to keep in mind that that there's a little kid there, so we can maybe give them a little bit of the benefit of yeah. the doubt that it's being simplified intentionally. I will say, however, that uh, representatives of our own um, phylum are, in fact, relatively simple at, the, at this time. They don't really have limbs. They don't have skulls. They don't even have nostrils. They have gills and little tendrils at the front and a, a basically a straight gut. And yeah, that's their... Compared to, say, a human or a dinosaur or anything like that, the only chordates you find in the Cambrian are, in fact, pretty simple. But yeah, overall, no, life in the Cambrian was not particularly simple. It was, however, fairly basal in that it was... It's very clear that the modern members that we have of these groups have significantly derived their form uh, from the forms that we see in the Cambrian. So, But simple and basal aren't the same thing. Basal just means it's the ancestral form. It doesn't mean it wasn't complicated. Like, you know... Uh, say lizards basically have four legs snakes don't have four legs you could say that makes snakes simpler i guess but they're still more derived than most lizards in that way so it's a bit dishonest to compare simplicity and derivation which is really what evolution is mostly talking about but hey let's see where he goes or is there another explanation that would fit how the bible (laughs) describes history and especially the flood well, in the Bible, and, and I'm going to ask you this question. If you don't know, you can just say so, and, and I'll explain it. But where did most of the water come from for the flood? Do you know? The rain. There was rain. That's exactly um, yeah, That's a great answer, and that's what a lot of people say. What we 40 days and that, 40 nights. Yeah, well, he's going to go into the whole hydroplate theory, I'm pretty sure. I, I like that he just dunked on him, though. He was like, oh, that's a good answer. That's what a lot of people say. And that's like the nice <laughs> way of being, oh, no, you're just wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, untitled child. Right. Get out of here, kid. Although, Incorrect. I'm pretty sure that you don't so the, matter. <laughs> the kid is definitely here because this is the target audience of this is kids, right? So this was streamed, if I believe, if I remember correctly, towards the beginning when people were really starting to lock down in the United States. And so, yes. This is supposed to be some kind of like replacement for like homeschool kids taking a trip to the museum is what I'm yes. suspecting. Um, what a rip off. Well, I mean, yeah, it's it's a rip off even compared to actually going like if I know yeah, that's yeah, that's what I mean. It's right. like you can't an online tour is never going to, you know, pan up to being able to be there and see the cool models and stuff like yeah. that. Although, you know, it's. It's less of a ripoff than just saying, nope, you don't get to see the dinosaurs. Go away, kids. True. So, I mean, it's something. And you know what? I, I'm not going to fault him for trying. I'm going to fault him for the content of the museum. But his motive in yeah. saying, hey, let's give the kids who would normally be here something. OK, that's that's fair. I'm, his motive there is is a decent one. And actually, I know that a lot of, um, shall we say, more more scientifically accurate institutions are doing similar events so oh you you know he's also he's trying to make it fun i mean as far as a as a presenter you can do far worse than our than our chum here oh yeah he's he's uh he's reasonably yeah. charismatic and he's doing a good job especially for keeping it kid friendly so i <clears throat> i will fall to some things but not uh, as far as his presentation and you know Doing something for the kids. Yeah, he's doing a fairly decent job. But let's see what else he's All right. got here. Let's get to this anomalocaris. Mm-hmm. The, the moment we've all been waiting for. Did you know that there is water even now under the crust of the earth? And during the flood... It... Yeah, in particular water-bearing minerals where it's not in a pool. There's no pools of water between the mantle and the crust. That's, mm. that's not a thing. Which is what the hydroplate theory posits. That there was somehow, in a physically impossible arrangement a layer of water under the crust above the mantle. 
that's impossible. It's n not even for a day is that a thing that's going to sustain itself. So, <clears throat> describe yeah. oh, okay. water coming up from the fountains of the deep. So we think that God split open the crust of the earth and under the ocean surface down on the floor, it would have split open and water would have come rushing out from under the crust of the earth. Water that was probably under pressure. It was warmer water would have come rushing out and it would have caused big tsunamis. What's a tsunami? Like big waves, yeah. It's like the the water would come up really high and start going towards land, and there'd be a lot of dirt, sediment in that water as well, and it would begin to bury things as it went, right? That would make sense. It would, but it would also sweep away any evidence of an existing ecosystem in situ, which is what we find in layers throughout the, his, the fossil record, right? Like, we find in situ in environments with plants and corals and things fossilized where they grew. Complete with and intact lest, roots. Lest we even touch on the, the deposition rates of numerous different types of, of fine minerals, like, for instance, limestone, which right. requires <laughs> warm, calm waters just in order to, to deposit at a very, very slow rate... And we're finding this sandwiched in between, you know, uh, very fast depositional materials like, like you know, whatever clay or sand or things, things of that nature. We need cult, or sorry, we need corp here to yes. to be giving us the uh, the the lowdown with the with the minerals. But, but I do know enough about limestone to know that <laughs> that is a big problem. But and it releases a ton of heat when it hardens. By yes. the way. But Erica, this was a very very calm tsunami. Mm. That's that's the thing you got to remember. It was a warm, calm tsunami. Uh, yeah, and and warm and calm in areas that it needs to be. Also, when it's passing over those pockets of ecosystems full of Basilosaurus and <laughs> and other cetaceans that that are coming, going to be buried much later, of course. Right. So as the water moved toward the land, it would begin to bury things that were where. Where do you think? What do you think? Some of the first things it would bury. Before it got to land, what would it bear? Okay. That's a good prediction, kid, which makes you kind of wonder why there aren't any actual fish in the Cambrian. Or at least nothing I would call a fish. I wouldn't call Picaya a fish. Or, or what about our Scleractinian corals? So, you know, modern corals, we certainly don't find them in the droves that we find them after, say, the Permian or the Cretaceous mm -hmm. at the Cambrian, and yet they occupy the same niche as, as the Rugos corals, which are abundant. So yeah. where's the Scleractinian corals, yeah, see, uh, Glendive Fossil and Dinosaur Museum? And that's the thing. This kid is actually answering the question in a way that makes sense. And yet it's not what we actually find in the rocks. And this guy's going to, I'm sure, just brush right past it. Because yes, apparently there just it, aren't bottom-dwelling fish. It turns out babies are quite good at poking holes in, <laughs> in the basal yeah. flood story. And, <laughs> and one other thing. And so YECs believe that every single, uh, uh, all of the creatures from the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic lived at the same time okay so and then why do we never find any any uh nomocaris fossils inside inside say of the stomach of a t-rex that's a good point actually yeah, they, yeah. that's that's we actually would. an excellent point i hadn't considered before we do the, find uh, dinosaur find gut any contents missing in, in consumption <laughs> where are the allosaur teeth marks on mammoths i mean right. and, 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 I and also and uh, um, maybe when you hook inside of the uh, coprolite of, say, T-Rex, you never find any sort of uh, remains of humans. You, you never find remains of uh, trilobites or, or anything like that. Yeah, trilobites I, make a bite-sized snack for anything. Well, any, right. anything that's willing to pass that hard, calcified skeleton. Oh. Which... Which trilobites? Yeah, actually, there's a reason they have that because you know what I don't want to pass is a trilobite skeleton because that sounds like it would be painful. Yeah, Kite, yeah, chitin is disgusting. But it's I, well, that's the thing. Trilobite, the the carapace of a trilobite isn't chitin; it's basically bone. 
Wait, is it really not? <laughs> no, it's not. It's calcified. It's more like a, a clamshell than it is like chitin. That's, oh, wow. That's I why they're that. preserved so easily. Because it's mineral. They're, they have mineralized carapace. Not all of their exoskeleton was mineralized. So that's why we don't have as many um, trilobite-like uh, feet or mouth parts or antennae. But right. the part that we get is the carapace because it was fully mineralized. You're swallowing a stone if you want to bite onto one of those things and just, you know, swallow it. So that is good to know. I had no idea. I yeah. I, always, I had always assumed that it was it was chitin based, but that makes a lot of sense. That that yeah. explains why trilobites make up so much of the record compared to other arthropods at the time, like our eurypterids or something. Exactly. Yeah, because it's I mean it's already it's already stone basically. It doesn't have to do anything to mineralize. It's already there. Yeah. Same thing with their their eyes. Actually, their lenses were mineralized. Oh, they're so cute. I love trilobites. They are. And, yeah, like things that are on the bottom of the seafloor. But not fish. Bottom-dwelling creatures on the seafloor. We're the Cambrian flounders, so, dude. We're the Cambrian flounders. The Cambrian creatures have in common? Well, most of them are bottom-dwelling sea creatures. Isn't that cool? So we think it... Well, except for the Anomalocaris you're going to show us, which was swimming in the water column. So, I mean, everything about this doesn't make sense, but we'll, we'll keep going fits what the Bible talks about as to how certain things would be buried and why these creatures are so deep down in the fossil record. So as we go through these animals, one thing you're going to find too is these are not simple creatures. These are very complex creatures. And let's just talk about a few that are actually in the Cambrian layer. So we're going to start actually on this side. Come over here and you're going to point out some of these things. Now we don't have any specific questions about this particular exhibit. So let's start with this guy right here. There it is, so Erica. Right over here by me. Oh, that thing is cool and as hell. Right I know, isn't it? I It, it kind of makes me sad that that nice of a model is there. <laughs> Oh my god, I love the colors they gave it. It is really cool. I always see them in sort of bland reds and oranges, but I like this. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, yeah. This this green with yeah. the polka dot thing, it's it's very creative, and I mean, it's, it is. seems perfectly reasonable. I, I don't have any reason to say that, no, Anomalous Karas couldn't have looked like that. So, yeah, I, you know what? Kudos to the, the artist there. You did a really good job. I don't know who you are. I wish that it's your cool. work had gone someplace better, it's but... It's cool they got it in an action shot too, mm -hmm. like where where it's kind of in 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 movement. The only thing I would say about the the spots is that usually those kinds of spots evolve as as a mechanism for for camouflage or camouflage or mimicry. So it would almost seem like you know because they look like they're mimicking its its sort of eye stalks or orbits or whatever whatever the structure you call the the eyes of the anomalocaris. Um, so I would I would ask. I would be concerned and curious as to what pressure would be suggested for, for the evolution of those spots. But I mean, that's me just <laughs> nitpicking a cool looking Anomalocaris. Ah, but Erica, you see, the thing is, Anomalocaris has to watch out for attacks from Mosasaurs because this is a creationist museum. The, actually, fair enough. Yes, fair. I'm going to get some more tea while, while we keep going here now that I've okay. seen our boy. Oh, right back. I, we had a quick and, question. Uh, is there soft tissue covering those dorsal scutes in that model? Um... I honestly, the resolution is a bit low, and I'm not sure. I, Eric, I'm not you've, sure. you've seen it in person, but you're nah, not sure anyway. Well, um, I, I haven't been there since like August 2018. Uh, the last time I went there, like, was like just days before, the, like, the I started to, you know, seriously doubt young Earth creationism. My last time going there was like August 15th of 2018. So it's. It's been a while, but uh, I don't remember seeing that. And so to add on top of that, if you think it's sad that they have that cool of a model of, uh, sorry, its name kind of rolls off of my tongue, uh, Nama Karis. Yeah. So they have a very, very rare specimen of a uh, jewelry raptor there. Yeah, there you told me about that. There are two in the world, and this is one of them that has it, and... It's the only museum that I've went to so far, like that has Acrocanthosaurus there. Okay. So it's sad that you know that Acrocanthosaurus has to be at that museum, but there's a reason why that they have 
Macrocanthosaurus there. It, it, it's because of how in Texas, you know, there's that alleged duck print of a human with a Acrocanthosaurus footprint, which looks absolutely nothing like an Acrocanthosaurus footprint. I mean, honestly, that print of the Acro looks like something off of the Flintstones. Yeah. Um, Is this the Paluxy prints? <clears throat> Are we talking about the Paluxy prints? I think it's a different. I'm not sure Here. though. Let me show you. Um, also, we have a, a quick thing um, from Keegan Rankin. What about other anomalous cards? We know there were multiple species, and correct me if I'm wrong, weren't multiple to, bleh, multiple species found in the same formation? I do believe that there are some formations with multiple anomalous cards. Um, anomalous cards actually did take up a few different niches. They weren't all just uh, pelagic predators. In fact, um, one thing that was interesting is uh, of I think about 10 years ago, people were doing a like sort of speculative evolution project about what things might have existed in the past that we just don't have fossils of. And one of the proposed organisms was a filter feeding anomalous card that used the bristles on its mouth appendages to filter plankton out. And then guess what got found? Oh, a filter feeding anomalous card, anomalous card. That used the bristles on its mouth parts to filter out food from the water column. Yeah, and I think that's fair enough. I mean, we know we know that in numerous different species, right, predation can occur sort of within the same genera or within the same family. So I guess you could argue that if this is a, a prey anomalocaris, perhaps there's a larger one that, you know, is is going after the, the other the other members of its family or genera. And so well, I did, that maybe could be why I spot sort of evolve. I don't know. I did Good once question, I guess. I did once upon a have asking a young earth creationist uh what would be a novel prediction about the fossil record that young earth creationism could give me. And uh his answer was that we'll find an even bigger anomalous card. And I was like, well why? Well, <laughs> why? Well, why one, why and two, why is that a novel prediction? I mean that's just like that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. like I just don't get it. Like, why would that be a thing that I mean, evolution would say, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that we haven't found the largest ever anomalous card because I mean, you know, just statistics. I, I, so that didn't make any sense to me. But uh, I still think that if you were to ask, they would say things like attacked by Mosasaurus because creationist museum. Yeah, or, or, you know, whatever, any kind of predator that we would expect to be outside of its range. It's very interesting that we found, and by interesting, I mean predictable, that we found nothing of the sort. Yeah. Well, another thing you could say for coloration is that it could simply be that it's uh, cryptically colored in order to make it harder to spot for other organisms that it's preying on. Like, you know, if, if it's hard to make out the silhouette, then it's hard to react to it appropriately, maybe. Oh. Yeah, I think I think you would almost have to know more about the substrate and and the the um, plant matter that's hanging out in the area. Yeah, but it's pretty either way, and I think we should keep, no, keep I going. Love it. Yeah, I love no, it. it is I very nice. It's very creative. I I was just kind of fooling around with like, okay, well, you know, how far how far in a in the hypothetical direction could we take this? <laughs> yeah, but but if you thought that what he said was stupid about finding a bigger. Uh, Normal Karis, trust me. I've heard things that are so much worse. No, that. I believe that. And we have. And, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and so, uh, um, and so Dapper knows about this. So, so, um, and so I used to argue and uh, debate with people who think that that the Earth is flat, and they told me that oh, the Earth is flat because of toilet water. Because when you look inside of a toilet. The water's flat, so therefore the Earth is flat. And one other one told me that the Earth is flat because a quarter is round and is still flat, so therefore the Earth is flat. Another one told me the Earth is flat because football does not exist. Those are all excellent arguments. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well oh. done. Also, we have a, a two ninety nine dollar redo super chat from Ian Chen who says, "Hi Daps, hi Erica, hi DD Lane. Oh, come on, hi Eric too." But anyway, he says oh. it's. 5.47 a.m. here. Oh, and another $2.99 reduced super chat that says, oh, and hi, Eric. So he, he got you with a full <laughs> separate super chat. And how, hello, Ian. And by the way, uh, Ian, uh, if you could do me a favor and send me uh, a message, like maybe on uh, uh, the Patreon or something, with the tracking information for the uh, the books that you, you got me from my uh, wish list, because I want to make sure that I don't miss them, because... Um, 
Uh, where I live, the normal package drop-off location is currently closed due to quarantining, and so packages are being dropped off at the door, and I want to make sure that I know when it's going to arrive so that I can make sure that they are not stolen. So if you could do me that little favor, that would be much appreciated, because I realized that last night. I was like, huh, I don't have an easy way to make sure that they aren't stolen if I don't have the tracking information. So if you could do me that I quick favor, it doesn't have to be right. I mean, whenever it's convenient for you. I think that we should probably get back to the yeah, video. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say that to Ian because I would forget if I didn't say it when I thought about it. But uh, okay. yes, Ian has gotten me. Um, uh, the rocks were there, and Evolution Slam Dunk from my Amazon wish list, which is very much appreciated. So thank you very much, Ian. I just want to say, I you're extremely appreciated around here because that is very nice of you. But here we go. Here, can you, can, do you know what that thing's called? Try to say it. Um, Close, really close. I would have given it to him, but okay. That was a really good attempt. Anomalocaris. Anomalocaris. See, this guy's being a little picky. My thing is like, okay, don't skip letters unless you know why you're skipping them. That's, that's it. That's my, my recommendation on how to pronounce these things. Because I even hear professionals in the field, like say these things differently so whatever just don't be as picky as this guy that's one of my critiques on him as far as his presentation style is he's a bit too picky on pronunciations he he's yeah he's roasting this kid for <laughs> i mean that's how i say it i i feel guilty now it looks like i've been saying it add it to the list right of things that i've been pronouncing wrong i wouldn't take yeah. i wouldn't take his word for it that it's anomalocaris and not anomalocaris so I, w I would not trust this guy to be the, the my authority on um yes oh and we have another two ninety nine dollar reduced super chat from Ian who says yes of course and you're the one to appreciate it. well thank you and I I do appreciate that and we're gonna keep using the word appreciated now apparently that's gonna be our new word of the day get kids that's <laughs> there it is here we go and it means abnormal shrimp true and that creature is absolutely incredible. Look how look how big it is. Let's see if we can get a picture with standing beside it, so you can kind of get an idea of how big that creature is. So the anomaly Caris was a creature that would have swam along the the bottom of the ocean, and it had these loads. So go ahead and step over here, and if you can zoom in, step over here, and if you can zoom in on those loads on the side of the anomaly Caris, you will see that. It was designed perfectly to swim efficiently, and as it would move through the water, there wasn't a lot of tension there, and so it could swim pretty fast and move very smoothly through the water. So some have said that this creature hunted trilobites. We don't know that for sure, but it would make sense that maybe it would go after things like trilobites. I, I seem to remember that we have injury on, or injury, type marks on trilobite carapaces that are consistent with anomalocaris mouthpieces but i'm i'm honestly not that into the cambrian literature that i would really say that for certain but i think we actually do have pretty darn good reason and we also have another 299 dollar reduced super chat from ian chen who says and hi bent i'm coming for you with a big old smiley face so watch out there bent Ovind. uh which by the way guys uh bent kent with bent is not happening this week instead we are doing another eric with erica where we're going to continue the uh, Eric Hoven video that we started so long ago. Unfortunately, but fortunately. Yes, it's a little bit of both. So it, it's going to be yeah. fun. We're going to give uh, uh, Bent a little bit of a break. Um, hmm. I don't get breaks, though. I think, I, yeah, I think with regard to to whether or not Anomalocaris or Karis, whatever, hunted trilobites, I think it would almost be, I find it a little bit, unlikely that that a predator as sort of efficient and as um enigmatic as the anomalocarids would be living in this time period and not members of its of its group would not be predating on such another enigmatic group i mean you want to talk about two things in the cambrian that you can't throw a rock without hitting um you're looking at the anomalocarids and, and trilobites yeah so i don't know i mean that would be like suggesting that that if you found leopards and and you know, Thompson's gazelles, that would be like saying, oh, we don't know that, you know, leopards ate Thompson's gazelles. I mean, yeah, but also... <laughs> what I would they be eating? Doubt... 
Yeah, I very much doubt that an Amalkaris would have been picky, but yeah. that's, I mean, that is speculation. Although, we should be careful not to pretend that representation in the fossil record is the same as representation in the actual fauna. Yes, fair enough. So, uh, also, um, Nestle 20 says, I thought it was just 100 centimeters, one meter long. Isn't that a bit too big? So, I, I'm not honestly too... I believe that's pretty close to about the max size for... Anomalocaris is about a meter, and that one probably was a little bit over a meter, but then again, it looks like to be about the same height as the kid, who was probably not much over like 1.2 or 3 meters, so it's probably a bit oversized, but then again, do we have a fossil of the largest ever Anomalocaris? I mean, probably not, so it's... I'm willing to say that it's not obviously terrible like it's not like it's a four meter anomalous card so it's probably a little bit too big but i'll give it to him mostly because it's such a cool model yeah which were on the uh on that same level in the in the cambrian area now a lot of the anomalous caris fossils are found in what's called the burgess shale up in canada right around alberta british isn't shale one of those rocks that's really hard to lay down during a flood wouldn't you know it? <laughs> Funny. The irony, right? Uh, the yeah. Irony. It's not. It's not in the the Burgess conglomerate. <laughs> it's in the Burgess Shale. Weird that. Columbia, and you can see that on our sign on the map over there on the in the upper right corner as well. So another creature that's really abundant in the Cambrian layer is what is this creature right? Trilobite. They're trilobites. Now, trilobites are all over the fossil record, and they vary in size from the size of a thumb all the way up to a uh, dinner plate to even bigger, a uh, couple, couple feet long. So they are can be very, very large, very small. Trilobites have eyes, and some of them... Well, some of them have no eyes, and then there's other kinds of eyes that trilobites have. But I want to talk about one particular kind. It's a schizocroyal compound eye. And I don't even know if I'm saying that right. But the eyes on these trilobites, some of them are some of the best eyes ever made. They are designed by God to, to fulfill a specific purpose. Now... When you look in the water, Alden, and you reach in to grab something that's on the bottom, is it always where you think it is? No. No, because light bends when it's going through the water into the other atmosphere that, that is around us. So the other medium that the light's traveling through, it bends. So it's not where you think it is. The trilobite eye could correct for that. So it could, when it looked outside the water and maybe a bird was coming along to, to get it, it saw the bird exactly where it was at. So it could avoid the bird getting it. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really neat. So the thing about the Cambrian layer is these creatures are not simple creatures. They are very complex. They just have in common that they're water creatures, most of them, for the, on the bottom of the ocean. So that's pretty cool. I think that gives us somewhat of an explanation from the Bible as to why these creatures are found in those lower layers, right? Yeah. Okay, let's look at over this side. Let's just look at one creature over here. So stay right over here. Look at that thing down there. You want to take a look, get a picture of that guy down there. Now that would be an interesting find in the Cambrian, wouldn't it? And it would. Yeah. I wonder if he's going to talk about the fact that uh, it's from the Cretaceous. There. That is an Umunosaurus, a model of an Umunosaurus. It's known as Eric. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just like that he was like, it's a model. Like, it's not a real Umunosaurus. Don't worry about it, kids. <laughs> don't be scared, it's fine. Don't have to, you don't have to worry about trying to bite you, your hand off. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, don't worry, it's, it's fake. <laughs> the Pleosaur, and this particular Umunosaurus, the one that this... Oh, hey, look what his name. Look what the name is, Eric. Oh. 
You, you, you got yourself oh. a plesiosaur named after you. <laughs> Congrats. Good job, buddy. <laughs> that really reduces the odds that there's going to be an Erica on here, too. And that bums me out big time. Oh, oh well. Well, there's probably not going to be a Dapper either, so. <laughs> probably not. Maybe it's because that it's been about almost two years now since I've been to the museum. Uh, uh, I, or maybe all <laughs> the times I was there, I never noticed. But honestly, I actually never even noticed that. Well, now you have. You, you've got yourself your own plesiosaur at the Glen Dye Fossil Museum. So there you go. <clears throat> also, I should sneak in and just put like a top hat and a tie on that uh, Allosaurus model up, up front. Just just leave. Break in just to do that and then leave. <laughs> it would be amazing. This is modeled off of was actually opalized. It's a fossil skeleton that had turned into an opal. And did you know, a lot of people say that opals take a long time to be made. Any gemstones or anything like that, that they take a huge amount of time to be formed. But a guy named Dr. Len Cram, who's an opal researcher, he has been able to grow opals in a matter of weeks. Okay, here, here's the thing about that. Like, okay, let's say <clears throat> I had a pressure washer, right? Like, you know, one of those water pressure washers. I could conduct mm -hmm. centuries worth of erosion with a pressure washer. <clears throat> okay, that doesn't mean that nature is going to do that. Like, the fact that humans yeah. can do weird stuff in labs doesn't necessarily mean that nature is doing the same thing. No, yeah, precisely. It's, it's, definitely, uh, it's definitely presumptuous to assume that because something can be done in a lab um, with, with every single aspect of it under control, that the exact same thing is, is going to happen in nature. Right. Um, it, which is ironically the same, the same complaint that young creationists will frequently pose to like abiogenesis experiments. Right. Um, the difference is no one conducting those experiments of, of trying to get those amino acids is saying that, that those are precisely the conditions. And in fact, they're doing their very best to mimic the natural conditions. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, humans do. So you know, humans do weird stuff in labs. Um, in fact, actually, you guys know where the coldest known place in the universe is? In a lab. Yeah, it's in labs. It's in labs that do cryogenic research on stuff like you know, superfluids and superconductors and stuff like that. Yeah, or Bose-Einstein condensates. Yeah, you don't get those in nature because humans can do things in their labs that without a human lab just doesn't happen in nature because it can't. Right. So. No. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the fact that you can form opal or oil or diamonds quickly doesn't mean that the Earth did it. You'd have to find a place in a, or a situation where your laboratory conditions could reasonably have been replicated. And I'm going to go out on a, just, just a little bit out on a limb and say that that probably hasn't happened for this opal. But eh, what, are, what do you know? So it doesn't take very long to make an opal. In the lab. And we think, again, this fits the flood because the flood conditions would have made it the perfect environment to form fossils. But was it to form opal, dude? That was your whole point. I don't think it was. But then again, I don't know a whole lot about opal, but you didn't say that. So, uh, sorry. Because you need water. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, and one thing that I want to add. So it was actually kind of ironic. It was because at one time, this guy in person said that, oh, well, if you can't replicate it in a lab, therefore it's not science. And then he was saying like that evolution has never been replicated in a lab and, and so on, therefore evolution isn't true. Uh, yeah, there's so many things wrong with what he said. Yeah. Also, It's almost like there's a double standard. <laughs> Wait a second. What? Exactly. What, what, what are these suspiciously Devonian looking fish? Does anyone recognize them? Because they do not look like anything I'm familiar with from the Cambrian. No, they look like, um, hold on. Let me make sure I'm getting this name right. Yeah, they look kind of like big triops. I, I, I guess, except I don't, I think those are supposed to be vertebrates. I mean, look at the shadow on the one on the, on the bottom, where it's got this twisty, like, left to right thing. Triops has no. its flexion um, top to bottom. 
these look like a species called Triops longicaudatus, which is proposed to be at least having a very similar relative in the Devonian. But did they have a, a side to side swimming motion on their backs? Because I don't know of any. I have Branchiopoda. Let me see. Hold on. Hmm. Well, I mean, if they're. Branchiopods? No, no, this isn't right. I, I, I really think that this is a jawless fish. You think it's well, really an egg? Well, so look at the bottom, right? At the bottom, we've got what looks like the shadow of a dorsal fin. And then if you look at the shadow of the organism itself, it's got this sort of like fish-like swimming motion. You can see where like the, the tail is curved. So I think it's using a side-to-side -side swimming motion that a triops wouldn't use. Because triops, they swim upside down and they beat their, their legs kind of like uh, some, some shrimp do. Well, the thing is, too, is that it, it could also, it looks very similar to me, like, um, which kind of placoderm is it? There's a placoderm that has a very similar shape to that, which would, oh, okay. could which be that. would make it not, a, yeah, which would make it not an agnathan, uh, but it would make it actually a vertebrate. Right. Um, I, let me see. Hold on. I think at the very least that these are vertebrates that we're looking at. Plus, there's like no, no real signs of like segmentation that you can see externally, which you would see in a triops. You would at least see the... The joint between the tagma. It could be uh, a member of Phyllopida, which uh, were very flat. Keegan Rankin says that he's pretty sure those are uh, Cephalaspis. That's possible, although the eyes are weird for a Kephal uh, Cephalaspis. And the head shape is a little bit odd. But anyway... Yeah the, yeah, the head shape would be... I'm looking at Cephalaspis now. Well, I don't know. Some, some of them... Actually, I don't know, Dapper. They might be right. Okay. But it's... There are some members of these guys that that, that checks out for. It's funny because the kid said, oh, fish would be, buried, would be buried at the bottom in a flood, which she's right about. They would be. But also, <laughs> they're in this display full of Cambrian organisms, but they're not found in the Cambrian. So what gives, Glendive? Where's your explanation for this this discrepancy <laughs> between your predictions and your your displays match your predictions, but the evidence doesn't match your predictions? It's this would be a perfect opportunity too for them to uh, to posit the what is it the runaway hypothesis or something like that where it's like the more intelligent organisms can flee easier. Um, yeah, I guess. I mean that that would be my best guess is that that's <laughs> well, where this is going. Why would Cephalaspis be more intelligent than Anomalocaris though? Like I I don't see any reason to to assume that. It, 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 that there are many different comparisons that we can make my favorite is that velociraptors were somehow stupider than like a um like a uh a, a modern sponge right, right. Like, <laughs> that they're ending up in those so, those damn genius sponges yeah uh, those there's the sclerotinian the corals and the modern peripherans really did get the drop on, <laughs> on all those their <laughs> They were sitting around with their with their pipes and top hats stroking their beards like, hmm, lads, how shall we escape the global flood until the very end? While all those twiddling stupid their, velociraptors their drown. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, yeah. let's 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 keep going for a bit. You need right. sediment, no, it's fine. you need minerals, you need rapid burial. All of these things would have been perfect during the flood of Noah's day. And so we think that gives the best explanation for these fossils existing. Now, the Umunosaurus is not found in the Cambrian layer. Why not? It is mm. something that we have in this particular exhibit as a, a water creature. So come on up all <laughs> this way, all in. That's, that's a water creature. Okay, sure. What is, <laughs> what is that reasoning? Now, now, this animal is not found in the Cambrian, but we do have it in Cambrian you know, layers, uh, because it is a water creature. Oh, of course. That's, of course. I, That's, well, there damn well better not be any other water creatures in the rest of this museum, because otherwise, why aren't they with the, well, with the this, rest of them? So, so it's a little bit of a spoiler. The whole section that we're doing, to, like their whole stream today, didn't get outside of their like water section. But what they apparently what it is, is arranged in like ascending through the water column. So we're getting away from like, you know, like benthic and sea bottom stuff and getting more into things that are living higher up in the water column. Oh, how clever. Yeah, I was going to ask why we had teleost fish that we've been looking at these little uh, angel fish in the background, why they've been hanging out and so, you know, so low in the column, but whatever. Yeah, well, like I, like I said, we're moving up through the column as we go. So um, I don't okay, think so he makes that 
Yeah, I don't think he makes that explicit, but it's pretty clear based on the animals that they show you that that's what they're doing. Okay. Yeah, or, and, and mm. he, yeah and trust me, I, I, out of all the times I've been to the museum, later on after this, when he starts seeing more dinosaurs, I um, mean, uh, then after that, you do see like a few Cenozoic animals, like a saber tooth and a mammoth, but those are pretty much the only kind of Cenozoic creatures that you do like that you you will see there okay so yeah okay so let's stand right here um so by the way this is where i started getting lazy and i just made the sensor bubble way too big so that way i didn't have to move it every three frames <laughs> okay <Fair enough. laughs> i was just like i was just like this is taking too long i'm done so are we missing anything else in this room I mean, is there is there something? Well, I don't know. Maybe we should just move on. What are we What are we missing? What is that Real. thing? Oh my word! What is that thing? All right, audience. When he, when we get a better view, I'm going to ask you what it is. Whoa! Look up there. What do you? All right. So that's <laughs> that's about as good a view as we're going to get. So we're gonna we're gonna start taking guesses. What do you, What do you guys think? We'll ask the panel and we'll ask the audience. Okay. A long tail with a ton of different ribby structures. Mm -hmm. Um, I am going to guess a type of mm, mosasaur or a type of eh, pleosaur. Stop sitting on the fence. You got to pick. Okay, pleosaur. No, okay. wait, mosasaur. Oh, is that your final answer? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, ben Benthoven says, it's a vertebrate. Well, yes. Congratulations, Benthoven. By going extremely wide in your taxonomic identification, you have, in fact, successfully identified this animal. Ben, that's yeah. cheating. All right. Someone says Mosasaur. Oh, it's more, I, was, I thought it said Mosasaurus, but it just says Mosasaurus. Mosasaur. It looks like the consensus is Mosasaur, but uh, Eric, would you like to... Oh, we have Nestle 20 with Crocodile. Uh, Eric, I don't know if you remember this one, so you might be cheating if you answer. Uh, yeah, so this is one that I do know it's... Oh, don't, don't cheat. The... Don't... So I do know... Don't tell us then. I won't say. Okay, okay, no cheating. Uh, Ewan says whale. Uh, so it looks like <laughs> so far our answers are whale, crocodile, and mosasaur. As far as the votes go, though, mosasaur is winning by far. So let's see what we get. I think it is. If you didn't know what was in the other room, I know you've been in the other room. If you didn't know what was in the other room, what do you think it would be? I have no idea. You have no idea? It kind of looks like an old, like an eel or a snake or something like that. Funny he should say a snake because currently the evidence is pointing towards snakes and mosasaurs being sister groups. Aw, cute. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Interesting. I actually did not know that. Yep. That's uh, that's where the current evidence is pointing. I I don't know all of it. I just know that's currently the the way that the field is leaning. I don't have enough. Um, I haven't read enough of the papers and whatnot to really know exactly why that is. But I do think it has um, a lot to do with the jaws of mosasaurs. But okay. <clears throat> that's that's my vague memory. So don't take my word on that one. But yes, I am fairly confident that currently. The uh, the evidence is trending towards mosasaurs and snakes being uh, sister taxa. But it in fact, let's go ahead and go in here. It in fact is a mosasaur tail. All right. If you Not guessed, right. if you guessed mosasaur, you win three internets today. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. Ding 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 ding. Yeah. What are you, you going to do with your internets, Erica? Um, I'm, I'm putting them in the internet stock market and since, it's, since the time to invest is now, obviously. <laughs> nice, nice. Actually, that reminds me. Um, Marvel has a what looks like a rather terrible new series of comic books coming out, but one of the, uh, the, the superheroes got his superpowers through exposure to, quote, internet gas. Oh unquote. yeah, I saw that. That's screen time. Yeah, I, I'm like, I don't, I don't even know what internet gas is supposed to be. What is the point of internet gas? What is it? It was his. It was his grandfather's experimental internet gas. I'll have you know. <laughs> that's I've, that's I've, true. I've looked into this cast of heroes. Yes, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's a satire or not. I have no idea. I've described it to several people, and they're like, "This, this has to be a joke, right?" And I'm like, "It doesn't seem to be. It seems like they're actually going to print this. I don't know." 
Um, oh, man. Yeah, uh. but experimental internet gas is apparently a thing in the Marvel Universe now, guys. So I can't wait to see how that comes through in the MCU. Okay. Yeah. yeah, probably probably memory antics, I oh, would imagine. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So look at that. Wow, that thing is huge. So let's look at your um, sheet here for a second, and let's look at the question uh, first of all. Well, I just like I just like that view there where you can see the the palatal set of teeth on the mosasaur, because uh, mosasaurs they don't just have teeth around their 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 the edges of their maxilla their maxilla and premaxilla. They also have another inner set of teeth that they can grab you with. So badass. You can actually see it in um. Jurassic World, when you see the, the Mosasaur leaping out of the water, it's actually one of the most accurate parts of their Mosasaur, was it has those, that palatal set of teeth. So, yeah, very scary. Yeah. That poor Mosasaur did not get a big enough enclosure. Uh, not for how ridiculously big it was, but then again, if it had yeah. been a, a realistically sized Mosasaur, it would have been perfectly adequate. Right. But, but then again, I guess that's a problem with large sea animals, even in the real world, they tend not to get a big enough enclosure in Aquaria. So about the Mosasaur. The Mosasaur, there it is right there. Read that question. How long is the Mosasaur? How long is the Mosasaur that we have in our, in our museum? Now, this one is named Sophie. This oh, we got our female Check representation. Me. There you go, Erica. It, well, it's not named Erica, but we got our female Finally. representation. So we've had, what, four named organisms and one was a female? All right, all right, ladies, that's pack it in. That's not terrible. That's... We have attained quality, pack it up. <laughs> that's right, that was the last big struggle for women's rights, was the Glen Dive Museum's <laughs> names of reconstructions. <laughs> for, for me, that checks the last box. That's the last one, okay. We don't have to worry about, like, say, the female rights in, like, the Middle East or anything, just, just as long as we got Sophie? No, no. Okay. It's fine, everyone Everyone, throw down your... Uh, your um, Pickets. Yeah, stop burning those bras, lady. We, it's all it's all good now. <laughs> we got Sophie. It's good. And it also, don't burn bras. That's really bad for the environment. They're full of all sorts of horrible things. Don't do it. Do something else. Uh, true. Yeah. True. If you've seen the movie Jurassic World, how many of you have seen Jurassic World? Ooh, well, me, me. In Jurassic World, one of the famous creatures is what? is a mosasaur. The mosasaur at the end of the movie Jurassic World eats the bad dinosaur. Yeah, by beaching itself, which always seemed a little bit funny to me. I was like, I don't know that that gigantic mosasaur is going to be very well served by la launching itself onto the shore to eat a dinosaur. Like, mm, just doesn't seem likely. But you know what? Not, not, it was a fun movie, so I'll just let it go. Indominus Rex. And Indominus Rex gets pushed into the water and the Mosasaur comes up and... He actually describes it in a more realistic way than what happens in the movie, which I love. <laughs> his, Funny, right? his version of Jurassic World makes more sense than the actual movie. Thanks, dude. I don't know who you are. I'm going to actually move you guys so that we can see him. But like, I don't know who you are, dude, but way to fix Jurassic World a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, he he's he's running a Cinema Sins account now. <laughs> Which is also funny. Uh, uh, um, it's because I can guarantee you that that probably was not his intention whatsoever. <laughs> um, yeah, probably not. But still, he did he, he did fix it. So good job. Eats the Indominus Rex. Now I want you to look at this Mosasaur. Do you think that this one? could swallow a T-Rex. Yeah. You think so? Look at that. You think that thing could swallow a T-Rex? <laughs> Maybe. Well, they could eat a T-Rex by bit by bit, but there's no way that mouth is big enough to swallow a T-Rex, right? Yeah. They couldn't even get the head in its mouth hardly. So, in the movie, that Mosasaur is about 100 feet long. Do you know how long this Mosasaur is? You know, let's go see. Let's look at the sign and see if we can figure it out. Let's see. 
Look, what does it say right there? How many feet? 40 feet long. So this Moses or Sophie is 40 feet long. So go ahead and fill out your little junior paleontology sheet and mark 40 feet long. That is what Sophie is. And that's about as big as they find them. They found a couple that were a little bigger, but 40 feet, 41, 42, somewhere in there is about as long as they found. So what, what do we know about Hollywood? They like to exaggerate, don't they? They make up stories about dinosaurs and stories about all of these different creatures. And so um, just to remember that these creatures are made by God and that much of what you see on TV is going to be an exaggeration of something that has been found. So always remember if you're watching something on the History Channel, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, a lot of it they don't know for sure. It's what they think might be the case. And so, so we want to point that out as well. I, I do, there's a couple things. One is I do want to point out that, yeah, he's, I'm not going to comment as to, you know, whether or not God is responsible because I don't get into the, the theological questions on the channel. But I'm going to say that, yeah, it is definitely true. Um, Hollywood runs on the rule of cool. Science runs on the rule of where's your data. So, um, yeah, take anything you see, even in, a, in a certain documentaries with a pretty big grain of salt, because they are there to entertain and make money. Even the ones that are ostensibly educational, they will be filling in gaps with things that they think are cool, even if reasonable enough. Like there was a lot of speculation on, say, uh, walking with dinosaurs, and most of it was fairly reasonable. However... A lot of it ended up being wrong because it was filled in with things that were cool but somewhat reasonable for which there really wasn't the data also um we have a quick question couldn't mosasaurs unhinge their jaws like a snake uh so i don't believe well one snakes don't quite unhinge their jaws what snakes can do um is one they have extremely uh elastic skin around their I guess their uh, their ventral side, and also um, the two sides of their jaws are not fused at the at the uh, center point, whereas you know in most animals they are. So they can actually move each side of their jaw independently, and that is where they get their uh, their ability to swallow things that are larger than their head is normally. I don't know of any evidence that mosasaurs could do that. Uh, that looks like it's a pretty uh, snake specific characteristic. And we have a $2.99 reduced super chat from Ian Chen. It says, hey, Daps, sent you another surprise, sent you an email. Oh, my goodness, Ian. Ian's going to put my kids through college at this rate. <laughs> the kids I don't have. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Erica, didn't I, didn't I send you a, uh, if I die of the, the, the plague, tell, the, tell my kids that I would have loved them if I'd had them? Didn't I tell you that? You did tell me that. It was, it was... <laughs> I, I would have honored it. Oh, good, good. Well, that's that still stands. If if I do in I, fact die of the plague, you you are now obligated to tell my kids that I would have loved them if I had had them. That that Ian would have put them through college. Oh yes, and that Ian would have put them through college. Yeah, I I like this part. I like this part where uh, the the checkmate evolutionists comes from the mosasaur and Jurassic worlds too big. <laughs> well. I, I'm going to be charitable here, and I'm going to say that I don't necessarily think that this is his argument against, or that he would even consider it an argument against evolution. I think he would more be saying that, you know, Hollywood isn't a good place for your, your information, which that's and true. That's, yes, that's, yeah, that, that's fair enough. Yeah, so. Say that. I, I, I mean, I have met a lot of people, like, who have said, oh, well, because I was in Jurassic Park, well, and then, you know, that must be how it was like in real life, too. And, yeah, I mean, Jurassic Park and all that, it never, ever was meant to be a documentary. It's meant no. to be entertainment. Yeah. And while they did have paleontologists on staff, they yes. intentionally deviated in several places from what the paleontologists were telling them. And the reason was, well, because it's cool. And you know what? That's mm. fine. It's a movie. It's supposed to be cool. Like, look. When I go and do my fictional entertainment, like I play video games or watch TV or whatever, I'm not looking, unless it's, you know, a documentary, for super high accuracy. Like, there's a reason that I do things like, you know, 
kill demons in Doom, and it's not because I want the most gritty, realistic thing I can possibly get my hands on, right? It's because stuff is yeah. cool, and that's fine. And so, yeah, that's, that's I think, what he's going with. I'm going to give him this one and say, yeah, he's probably just making a, a point I'd agree with, hopefully. Because I don't... I try to be charitable where I can, especially with creationists, because I'll be honest, I have a pretty strong bias against young Earth creationism. And so I try to make a conscious effort to not be critical where I don't have to be. So, yeah. yeah. Benefit of the doubt. Yeah. So let's go over here and let's talk about some other things in this seafloor. Um, so let's look at these seashells. Now we got seashells all around this exhibit. We got seashells that that extend from end to end in this particular room. And the question sometimes people ask is, well, why in the world do you have shells, seashells in a dinosaur museum? Why do, what do you think? Well, well my, my answer would just be that, well, it doesn't say it's the Glen Dive Dinosaur Museum, it says it's the Fossil Museum, so that's why. But I, I don't know yeah. what his answer is going to be. And what I would say is that uh, is that I have been to more uh, dinosaur museums than like that don't promote young earth creationism or like that do have shells. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, as far as I'm aware, shelled animals have lived for quite some time. Right. And, <laughs> and they are very easy to find because, well, they're already mineralized. So what's like what's going to stop it? Unless it's, mechanically, right, exactly. unless it's mechanically ground down, there's no reason to think that a shelled organism's shell isn't going to just keep on going. So there's a strong preservation, bi bleh, preservation bias. There, there it is, I said it, in favor of shelled organisms. And mineralized shells, especially. Excuse me. Because they were in the ocean? Yeah, that's right. And a lot of seashells have been found. <laughs> this this kid's adorable. Fossils. Know that almost all the kinds of seashells that we have today are actually in the fossil record as well. So all the kinds of seashells we have today are in the fossil record as well. Well, yeah, that's because the animals that we have today didn't just spring up a hundred years ago out of nowhere. But the thing I would like to know is if he can point to a single shelled fossil from more than say twenty million years ago, according to the quote unquote conventional dating that is in the same species as a modern shell. I would just like one. Or or address the the change in morphologic form of trilobites through the through through time, through oh, yeah. geologic time. Yeah, you know, right. I mean which is very fascinating and and quite unique because like you said we've got such a great, you know, sample size. Yeah. But because they don't they're they don't look like uh Humans have this strong bias towards mammals and at least towards amniotes, right? Like when people want to see transitional yeah. fossils, no one cares about the trilobites. They want to see like giraffes or whales or humans or or dinosaurs. Like people are like, yeah, but what about these little sea cockroaches? And then it's like, the what? I don't know. I don't care. You know, but yeah, but look at how I... look at how the great look how gradual the, the thing is. We have all these gradients in the morphological transition, and it, people just glaze over because they're like, you're talking about sea cockroaches, dude. I don't care. I, I am going to go out on a limb and say I care about trilobites enough for at least five people. <laughs> I love these guys. Well, you know what? On behalf of all the paleo people out there, I appreciate that you're you're taking up the slack from the general populace. I just think I think they're cute as hell, honestly. Even even the more uggo ones, I love them. I think they're adorable. Okay, but I, they're actually I, you're going to be hard pressed to find any kind of organism that I don't think is adorable. Yeah, I was going to say, Erica, <laughs> you, you seem to have a, a fondness for ugly organisms. So I I really do. I, some of my favorites are are the very awkward Devonian animals. Yeah. I I love them. Every oh, so, uh, every time. Every time there's an animal on screen that everyone else would be like, oh, what the hell is that? Erica's like, this is the most adorable thing in the world. I love it. I <laughs> I love the early Agnathans, as you know. They, they so are derpy. so sad. They're so sad looking. I I love them. <laughs> All right, let's let's get a special place. In let's keep going. We're at, we're at almost 18 minutes. We have less than 10 minutes to go on this. We could we could okay, get through let's, it. Let's get let's get a good solid portion in. Okay. 95% of the fossil record 
is made up of shallow marine organisms like seashells. So I think you have that question on there. Why don't you read that question? It says what? Fossil seashells are found on the highest mountains. True or false? So is that true or false? That is true. So now So that contradicts your earlier statement that animals that couldn't run very fast or that fled or that lived on the ocean bottom would be buried in the lowest parts of the earth because they would be buried first. Got it. So this disconfirms oh. the flood. Also, interestingly enough, this this really shifts the timeline around, right? Because essentially you've got to have these these clams and bivalves and things of that nature being buried and mineralized, and then we have to have the uplift. So that's suggesting that all the most catastrophic portions of the flood, where we get these huge mountain ranges that are, of course, modern popping up, that's going to have to happen around the end, right? It, I think so, which, yeah, it does... It, it compresses the already absurdly compressed tectonics uh, timeline to an even smaller portion. It's probably only a few months at the very end of the flood year or so, which, I, I mean, it's already at the point where that kind of energy that's required would be turning the Earth into a ball of plasma. And so now we're going to condense it into an even shorter amount of time. I mean, the Earth is just going to turn into a new star, basically, is, is what I'm getting out yeah. of this. There's there's that, and then there's also, like, I've heard the excuse before that it's like, oh, well, you know, um, water, the water is going to help with this sort of, you know, heat conduction, and then that's going to keep things from, which, of course, is, is absurd in and of itself. It'll just but turn to that, steam, superheated yeah, steam. Even that goes away with this, though, right? Because we're going to have to have the sea levels drop, and then the uplift of these mountains. Unless they're suggesting that the uplift happened while everything was still underwater, um, which I wouldn't put outside of the realm of possibility for at least some of these individuals. Yeah. Well, and here, here's something I want to point out about superheated steam, right? So people, most people have probably been scalded at one point or another lightly by some steam from a kettle or something, right? Eh, it's not too bad. Okay. I was in the Navy, and I worked in an engine room. And one of the things you do when you work in an engine room for training purposes is you read casualty reports, which are where something went wrong and a report had to be written. Well, ships are driven by superheated steam. You get steam up to around four or 500 degrees and you run it through a turbine and that turns the main shaft of the engine, right? And that's what propels you through the water. We're not running on gas here. So yeah, we're running on steam. Well, there was a, a casualty where... Um, the secondary coolant, which is the superheated steam that's directly running the turbine on a nuclear aircraft carrier, sprung a leak. And a guy got caught in it. Large portions of his skin sloughed off within a few minutes, and he lasted about two hours. Yeah, and no that's, thanks. That's at less than a thousand degrees. We're talking about tens of thousands of degrees worth of heat for this creationist plate tectonics. You yeah, would I'm going to give a big no thanks to steam. Yeah, yeah. Steam is, it, it seems innocuous when it's in your kitchen. But under the conditions that we're talking about, it's, I mean, it's basically just lava as far as your body is concerned. You're just going to die. And the temperature that steam can carry is, or the, the amount of heat that steam at any given temperature carries is very high because water has a very high specific heat capacity. So, mm -hmm. yeah, steam is an extremely dangerous thing. You should, uh, you should respect it. In fact, there were, um, there were valves that were just open and openly accessible where I worked, where if you put water on it, it would just boil away in less than a second, no matter how much you put on it, because that valve that was just sitting out there was around 500 degrees. You could yeah. just touch no, it. No safety cage. No thanks. Yeah. Thank you, but no thanks yeah. well, for, for being death by steam yeah. and having my skin slough off. Well, don't go into the engine room of a large ship. That's my recommendation. Good. Good idea. Yep. I will try to hold to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not only do we find seashells everywhere in the fossil record, they are on the highest mountains. Now, what does that mean that that mountain that has fossilized seashells on it, that mountain was at one time, or that land that is that mountain was one time underwater. Now, we're going to talk about it when we get upstairs, but we don't think that the mountains were as large pre-flood as they are today. So we'll talk about why that is and what we think God did to, to move the earth around in another episode. But our seashells, 
throughout this, we have examples of different uh, varieties, and then we also have fossilized examples of many of them as well. Well, before we move on, let's start um, one of the next questions on your sheet. It's actually the first question on that, on the inside of the sheet. What does it say? How many clownfish can you find in the marine exhibit? How many clownfish can you find in the marine exhibit? So what's a clownfish? What, what's another name uh, of clownfish that a lot of times kids call? Do you know? Yeah. It's from the, yeah, you do. It's from the movie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you do, stupid kid. You know it. You're kids embarrassing love cartoons. me. They do. Answer the question. <laughs> My guess, though, is that he actually hasn't ever heard a kid volunteer this name for a clownfish. That what has actually happened is that he's reminded them that Nemo is a clownfish. And then kids have gone, oh... And that, yeah, he's, oh, he's, yeah. yeah, and then he's just turned that in his mind into kids call clownfish Nemos. Because I've never heard yeah. a kid do that, but. I, I actually don't think I have either. I think most children I've interacted with have, have at least known the clownfish is a clownfish. They, I have heard that blue tangs are dories, though. Okay. But have you heard any of the kids point out that in the absence of Nemo's mom, Nemo's father should have become a female because clownfish are sequential hermaphrodites? No, and but I have heard that 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 makes the plot a bit strained, a little bit more strange. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little, little bit. Marlin's uh, Marlin's maternal instincts were just kicking in. Oh, he was he was currently undergoing the the transition, if you will. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, yeah, because the largest. Uh, which usually means the oldest clownfish in a colony is the female. And then when she dies, then the next largest male clownfish will simply become the new female clownfish because they are sequential hermaphrodites. Also, one of the only saltwater fish for aquaria that are commercially raised because it's almost impossible to commercially raise most other ones because they just don't breed well in captivity. But clownfish are an exception. Almost all clownfish in uh, fish stores are, you know, like pet stores are uh, captive bred. So you don't have to worry about your environmental impact as much there. Yeah, I was I was concerned we were just playing out finding Nemo hundreds of yeah. thousands of times. No, very for every clownfish that's all, yeah, almost no clownfish are actually wild caught anymore because they are very easy to breed in captivity. So there's a, there's a plus on that one. No, a lot of little kids. Yeah, that's right. A lot of little kids. Uh, think of them as Nemos, right? So sometimes they don't know what a clownfish is, so you tell them, well, find the Nemos and count those. So let's start counting here, buddy. Let's see here what we can find. Can you find any clownfish right in this area? Uh, there's one right there. Oh, there's one right back there. I'm, I'm going to skip there? a little bit ahead because there's nothing right, particularly interesting about counting so clownfish. Add that clownfish to your list. There is also one. We're still right down in there, right? I see some more. Do you see the other one? Now, it might be hard for you guys to see it. Uh, three. Yeah, we have three so far, right? You know, dude, it is hard for us to see it because your, your broadcast is at like 480p, dude. Get a different camera. <laughs> just, just, yeah. just, just want to point that out. And like, uh, just use an iPhone. An iPhone has a better camera than whatever it is you're using. It, remember, so creationists are always working at least thirty years behind. So that's true. This is probably working with the cassettes. This is yeah. This is filmed on VHS. <laughs> yeah. And as we go around the mosasaur here, let's see if we can find some more. Right there. there are there are two. there are two, and it might be a little bit hard to see. Uh, there's two there as well. So we are up to shark's jaw right there. Did you know there's a lot of shark teeth found? Right. Keep them counting. So we're at five clownfish, so remember that. Look at that shark's jaw right there. Did you know there's a lot of shark teeth found in the fossil record as well? In fact, if you come down below here... Yep, and that's because sharks shed their teeth regularly, have a lot of teeth, and shark teeth are mineralized. So it's easy. Wish I could do that. Yeah, well, you. So it seems like mammals basically gave up their polyphodont dentition in exchange for gaining heterodont dentition with very specialized shapes. It seems like it's apparently a bit tricky to try to get both in the same jaw. So. 
Yeah, you, you would imagine, too, that with, with heterodontia, keeping things organized would, would go astray quite quickly. Yeah, you wouldn't want to imagine accidentally... Imagine trying to get braces every couple of years. Oof, yeah. Plus, you wouldn't want to have some weird accident where a molar grows out where your incisor should be. It's cause you you're... definitely would not. That would be unfortunate. How, how are you going to bite your apple with, with a molar? I guess that that's that's when the uh, the dexterous primate hands come in handy. Yeah. Well, also humans are pretty good at using knives, so I guess you could just cut it up and then chomp it with your your new mouthful of molars, which sounds like a horror movie monster or something, but an oddly not very scary one unless you're grass. Honest, honestly, though, I've seen a lot of horror interpretations where, where t with monsters having too many incisors, like teeth don't necessarily have to be sharp to be unsettling. Yeah, that's true. You know, like where it's yeah. just in, uh, you know those oversized, stretchy smiles. Those are that's a pretty common trope in horror, and you don't really see too many canines in those. I've noticed. Although the the longer we talk about teeth in horror movies, the more likely we are to get onto the movie Teeth, which we probably shouldn't. Yeah, I don't want to demonetize this video any further. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, well, without even describing the plot of that movie, we're going to continue on. Here, there's a, See that big tooth right there? That's a big shark's tooth? That's a megalodon tooth. Largest shark that ever lived, megalodon tooth. Really pretty amazing. That's a real megalodon tooth. And, that, and the shark jaw in the back is a real bull shark jaw. So the shark teeth, the reason there's so many shark's teeth is they're always losing their teeth. They, they kind of pop up from the back side and they'll lose the teeth in front and then the, there'll be another one come up to take its place. So let's keep going over here. Now, back there behind this fish, kind of next to that black and white fish, what do you see over there? What do you see over there uh, on the wall? A clownfish. Another clownfish. Yeah, good Yay. job. Way to spot that clownfish. So what are we up to now? We have some, <coughs> some fish called Ichthyodectes. Now these fish are saltwater fish. Oh. And many, of the t many times they find them in places like Kansas and Nebraska. Now do you know of any oceans near Kansas and Nebraska? No, that's... That's right in the... The Western Interior Seaway? I know, I know about that one. The one that, you know, we find uh, land deposits, and then as the sea levels rose, we find marine deposits, and then we find more land deposits over on top of that. And in fact, that actually happened a few times, which isn't well explained by a flood. In fact, that was the point of a big section of one of my videos was like, hey, let's look at the geology of Colorado. Wait, are you telling me that oceans can undergo precession and recession? That's ridiculous. Yes, that is completely false. I should never have said it. Apparently, sea levels are always static unless there's a global flood. That is the only explanation. Okay, so, okay, so has anyone ever seen water change sea level before? And I'm not talking about some kind of local flood. <laughs> or the tides. No, I'm not talking about that either. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't... I do not know how he thinks that the geological record of the Midwest of the United States is going to be helpful for the flood because it has marine deposits. Because, um, spoiler, it, it, it's really, really the very opposite of helpful for the flood. But then again, I guess I could say it that is. about any area in the world. Yes, fair enough. But it's, it's especially unhelpful in the Midwest of the United States, I would say. I, I think, yeah, I would agree with that. Just just because we're dealing with, with so much, so many hints of long change occurrences. Yeah. The middle of the United States, right? So that's a really uh, interesting thing. And how do we explain it? Well, in, if you believe in long ages, some people think that there was an inland sea that went through the middle of North America. But we think that during the flood, and after the flood, a lot of water settled in the middle of North America. So hold on, is he saying that the marine deposits in the Midwest of the United States, like the Cretaceous, like Western Interior Seaway, was an inland sea that was left as a puddle by the flood? Is that what we're going with? It, it, it sounds think... like we're it sounds like we're going for the Paleo Lakes, but one that's you know, big enough like... to be a saltwater ocean full of salt sea. Like saltwater fish? Uh, evidently. 
I'm not the only one I who don't... think that that seems um, extremely far fetched, am I? Like, that's not just me, right? Like, that of other people's. Yeah, I mean, everyone knows that the entire interior of North America is just a big bowl. <laughs> And then that also would mean that all of the Cenozoic deposits that continue on for millions of years after this are also all going to be condensed into post-flood period where we're not having this flood as our excuse for the deposition of the sediments. Hey, big bull hypothesis is, is, the, is reigning supreme in creationist <laughs> literature, obviously. Man, this is... So I was actually thinking, like, maybe this guy, like, okay, so like, if... I might actually do a creationist tier list someday, by the way, which I think might be fun. Oh, God. I know. That would be fun, well, actually. Well, I mean, everyone likes tier videos, so... Um, which, actually, I might need some help on, so I'm, I might be consulting. I would love to assist. Uh, but, like... So, like, Kent Hovind is basically, like, an F-tier creationist. Like, he has the worst arguments. He has the least knowledge of basically any famous creationist that I know of. And I, I was thinking that this guy is... Maybe he's, like, a, like a C-tier... But this whole thing where, like, oh, all of these marine deposits are just from a lake, basically, like a puddle, essentially, that got left behind by the flood. Ah, oh, that drops them down considerably. Like, this is... D-tier. Yeah, D-tier yeah, max. That's some D-tier level creationism right there, buddy. That, you, you just dropped in my estimation. And so you would have these things buried even in places like Kansas and Nebraska. Let's see if we can find... Any more clownfish? Let's see. Look back there in the corner. Do you see what? Yep, I see it. I see it. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. And um, I, we are up to how many now? Oh, there's a little Eurypterid model at the bottom. You see that? Bottom yeah. left. I don't think we're gonna focus it on it, which is too bad. No, I. We saw it a little bit when we were back by the Mosasaur. You can see it a bit oh, in the background. We? I don't, yeah, but yeah. I, they, they should focus on it, though. Like, look at it. It looks really cool. It, it's actually a cool model. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And Dark Knight Apologetics says, Kent Hovind is an idiot. Yeah, he is. And uh, also, that's a character they shouldn't have killed off in Supernatural, because he was one of the best characters on the show. But yeah, it's just a real shame, like, that all these cool models, you know, are, are just being wasted like, here at this museum. But... I guess it is what it is, and we really can't do much about it. Yeah. I I would, I wish ill on no one, but if any museum close to where I live were to go out of business and, and sell their models, I would love nothing more than to have a giant Eurypterid model just in my house as like a centerpiece for when people walk in. You it's know, just a, like a Eurypterid or, or like a Thanksgiving centerpiece. That would be nice too. You know, er yeah. er Erica, I take commissions. Just have me sculpt one. And then send it off to someone who does 3D printing, and there you go. I'll sculpt the Eurypterid, and you can have it 3D printed for you. Pro would, problem I would solved. That. Problem solved. I, I would love that. And <laughs> actually, speaking of sculpting, the surprise from Ian Chen was, in fact, a drawing tablet for my computer, which means that sculpting just got a whole lot easier as of the end of the month. So, that's... Is a, it, what, what kind of drawing tablet is it? It's, uh, it is a... Uh, let's see... We on Inspiroy's H640P graphics drawing tablet with battery free stylus. Oh, sick. Yeah, so it is. It's it's not like one of the super high end ones, but it is one that is uh, much better than the mouse that I'm using. It is a. Uh, yeah. It's it's not exactly like uh, an entry level. It's sort of an intermediate, but basically that's because my more entry-level tablet doesn't currently work. Sad face. So I've been sculpting yeah. literally with my mouse, which is, it's been tricky, but hey, I've been doing it. It's been going okay. But yeah, so the sculpting just got a whole lot better thanks to Ian Chen. So shout out to you, Ian Chen. Thank you very much. Man, he, I'm gonna have to start adding new things to my wish list. He's gonna buy the whole thing. No. <laughs> yeah, the, the worst problem to have. What else should I put on my wish list? Seven yeah, true. Clownfish. That's pretty cool. We now have seven clownfish that have been counted. <laughs> and then as we make our way around here. You think he's going to ever make a point about how the uh, the formation of the flipper in that plesiosaur looks extremely different from the formation of essentially functionally identical flipper in a mosasaur? Oh, I very much doubt it. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, probably not. Oh, yeah. And so in, about this plesiosaur and so um right underneath it, it i 
right underneath it, like is where, like where, like the, where they show like the picture of the basking shark, and, and like and they say that oh well they found a plesiosaur in 1977, and oh my and, god. We know that this is a plesiosaur and, and we have books in the shelf about it, but that's one of the worst arguments that you Oof. ever could use because we know for a doubt that it was no plesiosaur. It was a basking shark. And I mean, heck, even AIG has even gone on to say, you know, like how that we know, like from like the uh, sketches of it, that it was a basking shark. Right. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, that was one of the arguments I used to use when I was a YEC, and I got that from this museum. Mm, sorry. And, after, and <laughs> yeah, after no, I know I, the exact picture you're thinking of. Me I too. I know the exact one. And yeah, and when I got creamed that that badly using all these all of these arguments, it, that was kind of a planting of the seed for me thinking, you know. Maybe younger creationism isn't the position that I should take. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> I, yeah. mean, I mean, you know, for them to give out all of these arguments, that's like saying that you're going to give them cardboard, a, eh? you know, that, that's like saying you're going to give them cardboard, a, eh? it gets people like who have guns and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I, it's there. Everyone's got that. Everyone who leaves Young Earth Creationism has that hole up moment, you know, where you're like, wait a second, <laughs> this doesn't quite add up. Hold on a second. And yeah. mine, mine, I've said before, mine is finding out Homo habilis was just a legit fossil that they they said was never found. And then I remember thinking as a youngster, too, I was like, well, why does it have a name if it's never been found? <laughs> right. Well, to be fair, <laughs> hypothetical taxa have been given uh, names in the past, although it's less common now. Um, they don't typically get binomial nomenclature, though, do they? Uh, sometimes they're given things that sound like um, genus names. Uh, and there's also, like, um, the hypothetical uh, pan prior is a binomial. As far as I know, that's uh, a still hypothetical organism. Mm. So, which would I, I... I hear different things said about it. I know, I've heard the name several times, and it's usually said to be something like... The ancestor between Pan and Homo, although why you would give it the genus name Pan, I don't know if it's the common ancestor of both, but I've heard that name bandied around. Um, Tetrapteryx was the name of a hypothetical uh, bird ancestor with four wings, which <laughs> was then later confirmed as a prediction. Um, basically, uh, a scientist in the 1800s, I don't remember who it was, noticed that... Um, Certain birds, and he didn't know about mutations, of course, but certain mutations will cause uh, the scales on bird feet to turn into feathers. And he noticed mm. that they, they were, in fact, asymmetrical feathers. And so he hypothesized that birds might have been descended from animals that had wings on their hind legs as well as their forelimbs. And so he drew this little picture of a four-winged bird with the sharp, uh, toothy beak, and he said it, he called it Tetrapteryx. And then, of course, we found Microraptor, which is, in fact, a four-winged Paravian. So he was he was right. So good job, that guy whose name I don't remember. I'm sorry. I know you're dead and you don't care, but wish I remember your name. Hold on. Are you saying that we made a prediction using evolutionary presumptions? Yep. That then was found to be correct? Yes. Yep. Ugh, impossible. <laughs> Shut it down, boys. That's impossible. It's because evolution doesn't make any predictions at all. No, yeah. No. <laughs> Don't you mean evolution? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yes, it is. Oh, oh. I, I like to spell it with evil in all caps and then just put the ocean at the end. <laughs> it's oh, always yeah. more fun I that know. way. Evolution. Yeah, I, Neffy, Neffy is a big fan of, of verbally highlighting that. The evolutionists. <laughs> That's so yeah. bad. Uh, Oh, well. Poor Neffy. Very first time uh, I ever went to this museum... One of the people who worked there, he was trying to mock evolution. And he was all, he he was all saying, "Oh yeah, well actually it should be called devolution." And the that he was laughing as if it was like the biggest checkmate a against evolution, like by calling it devolution. But but because he didn't realize that you could just go with evolution, like yeah, they, there's already low hanging fruit. Right? Don't that's that's pushing it way too far, dude. Like that's just basic comedy stuff. Like you're 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 being too much of a tryhard just don't well we'll keep going we've only got uh like less than three minutes of this thing 
We can do it. This is a plesiosaur. Yep. And plesiosaurs are really cool creatures as well. And they're also a marine creature. And uh, we, we find those in different spots in the fossil record as well. And as yeah, but only in the Mesozoic, which is a little weird. I'm Not digging a... these little minis. Though. Oh, I know. They're little adorable baby plesiosaurs. Oh. They're very cute. I like that it suggests parental care, right? That's yeah. kind of cool, too. Which isn't outside the realm of possibility. They would have at least had to give live birth. So, you know. Right. Here, I want to talk a little bit about this massive turtle. So if you can take a look at the turtle... I'm looking We're at it. We're going to talk about that a little bit, and I just want to kind of introduce it, and then we will come back to the turtle next time. Oh, he's being a tease. So this particular turtle is a Protostega gigas. It's, a, it's one of the largest turtles. It's not the largest. There's one even larger than that as well. And uh, we are going to talk more about creatures that are found in the fossil record that are a I just want to point out that yet again we have paddles that are formed differently again to the previous paddles that we saw on the four limbs of other animals which he's not going to talk about but it's still curious as to why the common designer would keep fiddling with the same basic idea and keep doing it in such different ways but a eh. lot larger than they are today and is there a biblical explanation for that well, we think there is, nope. and I would encourage you to... No, there isn't. The Bible doesn't even suggest that things were bigger in the past, except for saying that there were giants, talking about giant humans. But the thing is that the Bible doesn't say that turtles were gigantic or anything. It's just a post hoc rationalization that you've decided to shove into your theology because you noticed that there were big fossils. The Bible it's has nothing to my... say. That's one of my least favorite like Kent isms is when he brings and and G Man did this too and I didn't really get a chance to address it but when they bring up the giant human skeletons that the Smithsonian's <laughs> covering up that one that one really because because there's nothing almost that you can say to that except no yeah. no yeah like that's uh... not what's happening um you know I think that would be quite a large fine someone could make. You know, the Smithsonian could be making the even more of the big bucks with, with giant human skeletons, but whatever. Yeah, uh, oh well. And the, that's another thing, was why would the Smithsonian cover that up? Like, do you really think the Smithsonian gives a crap if it confirms the Bible in some weird way? Like, I guarantee no. you they don't. They really don't. No, they really don't but at all. <laughs> the, thing is, the thing is that there are a lot of museums out there with archaeological evidence that gives some corroboration to biblical stories and no one's hiding it nor nor are these christian or jewish institutions no no one is out there saying that there isn't isn't viable chronology yeah. from from the biblical text no one is saying that yeah. I've, I've never met anyone who says that yeah i i have a degree in history and while there is like the bible isn't taken as oh well it's in the bible so it must obviously be true but on the other hand no also no one is like oh well none of this can be true and we have to make sure that no one thinks it is like that's not how anyone is operating i promise you well i guess i can't say anyone but i will promise you that that is not how the fe general fields of science or history are operating there's there's yeah, no, no concern I for disproving the bible yeah and no one i know is is making that claim sorry eric go ahead yeah i, I sorry about that and so you know the only ones who I really have ever heard that, oh, they're trying to discredit the Bible is is always from either young earth creationists or or you also get the flat earth like uh, version of it, too. And so those two are the only ones who I who I have ever heard say um, say anything about how, oh, well, oh, well, all the people on the other side are just trying to discredit us. I mean, granted. There are some atheists and whatnot of I like who are anti-religion, like say Jerry Coyle, Hector Dawkins. Yes, but it's not the whole community as a whole. And I actually even say like a Dawkins, if you could take something from the Bible that was demonstrated to be true because of say historical or even paleontological evidence, I don't think that Dawkins would f say that that it is in the Bible is a reason not to believe it. No, certainly not. I mean, Dawkins is absolutely an anti-theist. I think he's claimed that. I, oh, yeah. I believe he's made. That. He's very open. Oh, yeah, that, but, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, but you know, no one is no one is going to to discredit historical corroboration. You know, if if that corroboration exists, why would they? Yeah, it's 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 very bizarre. It's I think it's this conspiratorial mindset that a lot of um, it's not a lot of Christians. It's a very specific subset of Christians, especially in North America, have where they oh. <clears throat> they have this idea that. There is their version of Christianity, and then there's this, the rest of the world is controlled by the dark forces of evil, who are all just out to go and take people out of the one pure version of Christianity that they believe in. And it, the thing is that if you're not in that group, it seems like a very strange idea, because you realize, I don't care about taking people out of this version of Christianity, and even if you're someone who does... You probably don't care much about disproving the Bible, especially if there were something that were helping to prove some claim of it. Because one other thing is, the Bible doesn't just stand or fall as a single thing. Like, the Bible can well, be right about some things and wrong about others. That's a thing that can happen. Yeah, well, people make, I believe, I, I, I think this, that people make the mistake quite frequently of, of assuming that it's an entire tome rather than taking it for the numerous books that it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but whatever. Um, I don't know that we're actually going to really finish this up because he said we're not even going to talk about this thing except for next episode. Um, there was a question as to why we did episode two instead of episode one with this. Well, I watched episode one. It was really boring. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 it. <laughs> yeah, er, er, exactly. Er, Eric sent it to me actually a fair a fair while ago. Um, and yes, I was yes, like, I, I was like, uh, we could do this, but this one is just just so boring i don't i don't want to do this one and then he sent me this one and he was like this one's better i was like all right yeah we'll do this one uh we also yeah, have a 199 super chat from kakarot what about hoven's lie about evolving from rocks no oh, that's oh. another classic <laughs> goodness yeah wow. i mean the thing is so okay so i watched i watched mark drisdale chat with um jason maddox last night on saying for truth's channel and they talked quite a bit about abiogenesis and so I was kind of spurred after that because, you know, Maddox was promoting rather, rather seriously that there was no good literature out there really about abiogenesis. So I, I started reading, I probably got through like five or six papers last night on, on you know, bas they're basically literature reviews on what do we know mm -hmm. um, right now. And all of that coming from a rock stuff is rooted in like this 1923 hypothesis about the primordial soup, mm. um, which, which is that all the minerals come, you know, directly from, from earth rock, which isn't out of the realm of possibility, mind you. And some of those minerals are going to have to come from, you know, from earth rock, but there's, there's so much more to the hypothesis than that. And not just the primordial soup hypothesis, abiogenesis in general. I mean, some believe that the amino acids were seeded from, from elsewhere. Some believe that the phosphorus and nitrogen is, is sort of this perfect combination of, of uh, an ideal atmosphere, hydrothermal vents, and, and the, the proper UV radiation. You know, so to claim that that's even close to what, that's like saying that evolution says we came from monkeys, you know, so which isn't it's not the whole story yeah. you know what i mean also yeah uh, real so quick more i just want to say tesla ranger you got to be much more polite than that man that's that's some pretty harsh words that you just put in chat in in klingon there don't think i didn't read it <laughs> yeah i did getting did rowdy it. the chat gets rowdy around here. yeah yeah so it's yeah i don't be be nice especially since now we have one of my, uh, I don't know if I could say a viewer, I don't know how much he watches or anything, but we have one of the people who has been rather critical in the comments here. So be nice, guys. No no cursing people out in Klingon. Come Wait, on is now. Faithful, Honest, and True in the comments? No, Mountain Lion is. Mountain Lion, who uh, has actually been commenting throughout most of the morning. I've been trying to juggle uh, working on this video with, with chatting with him in the comments. So actually, I don't even know if it's him. He's using a male lion in the profile picture, so I'm just going with it. Which, oh, fair enough. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, be, be nice, Tesla Ranger. Come on, that's those yeah. are that's that's the kind of insult that even Klingons take seriously. So, I know because I read that book. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, anyway, was really dorky, dapper. That was so dorky. Hey, I have a copy of the Klingon dictionary on my bookshelf. <laughs> not, not kidding. I, 
fortunately, since I film this in my dad's study, and since I usually show up down here these days, just because I can, I don't know, it feels more official, I guess. Um, my, my very telling nerd memorabilia is not in the background for me to be called out on. So I mean, you getting a little shell in the back. I don't know. That's not very nerdy. No, yeah. no, 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 no. That that's not even close to the kind <laughs> of nerd memorabilia that we're discussing here. Actually, I do remember um, there was a short conversation in Klingon in Chesh's chat during one of her uh, art live streams. That happened. So that was that was interesting. Yeah. yeah so it turns out that uh, I think three people in there knew just enough Klingon to actually have a short conversation in it in the chat. To get by, yeah. So that's we we got some pretty big nerds in uh, in the community, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna call it for the video, and I'm gonna give some quick channel news after I let Eric and Erica plug anything they want to. So Erica, what do you got to plug? Oh, what do I have to plug? I don't know. Um, I'm I'm working on a couple of videos, but the order is completely up in the air. I got to get a better schedule for myself. Um, I guess. If you want, you can go support RJ tomorrow over on Standing for Truth's channel because uh, he's he's debating Nephi. Um, and mm. other than that, I don't know. Uh, expect a Permian video from me soon and also a video on Old World, New World Monkeys, um, which should be pretty cool. And actually, now that I've been doing all this research on abiogenesis, I'm thinking about making a video summarizing um, the, you know, what we know and what we need to know and what we may never know. Okay. Okay. Um, so that might be cool. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> awesome. All right. And Eric, what do you have to plug? I know you have at least one thing coming up at the end of the month. Yeah. Uh, so as far as videos on my channel in general go, honestly, I uh, honestly, I'm not really too sure about that. Uh, I, I am kind of out I, as of right now. I'm kind of out of ideas for videos in general to do on my channel. So in it, so if anybody has any sort of ideas, I definitely would appreciate that. But the one big thing that I do have coming up on April 30th, it's not confirmed whose channel is going to be on yet. If I had to guess, maybe uh, praise that I am that I am, like uh, the last time, or maybe standing for Truth's channel. I actually am going to be debating Kent Hovind once again on if birds are dinosaurs. And so look forward to that. Okay. Well, let's hope he doesn't try to look you up and give out your address. Yeah, but if he tries that, that's not going to be a very good idea. Is because I have a dad like who is a formal FBI agent, so that wouldn't be a very good idea. That's that's a good backup to have, though. That it is. Yeah, definitely. That is. And uh, yeah. Um. So what I have coming up? Uh, let's see. The next thing on this channel is actually going to be Eric with Erica. Erica's going to be back. Ooh, yeah. I'm ready. I mean, at at this point, it's like it's like we have joint channels. <laughs> we we sort of do. We we do appear on one another's channels quite frequently. Yeah. But that's because we've got a good we've got a complementary body of knowledge. We I think. do. Yeah, I think we we make a really good team, and uh, we're we're good on air together. So I I think that absolutely. Yeah, we got. I I've heard this from from obviously the paparazzi and the numerous sources that we've got oh, on right. air chemistry. So that's that's nice. Yes. I've had a blast talking with Eric as well. Absolutely. Eric, Eric, maybe Eric can come on one of the one of the videos on your channel sometime. Oh yeah, Eric, I I'm I'm needing some what do I need? What do I still need to fill? I'm having a series of guests. That I guess that is something I can plug. I'm going through Standing for Truth's assessment that I rather Standing for Truth and the Standing for Truth brain trust. Um oh on their assessment of my discussion with G-Man and they cover quite a bit. So I'm trying to have a different guest on. The, the first video is just me because it's it's on chimp genetics. So I, I could kind of handle it myself. Um, but then I'm having different people on for different subjects. And I think I still need a couple filled, Eric. So what what do you what do you like to talk? What's your favorite? Birds and dinos? Uh, well, uh, I, I am going to be going to school to be a paleontologist. I'm oh, so dope. my um, so my main focus right now is um, Mesozoic, but at the same time, I don't have a problem with learning more about Cenozoic or Paleozoic. Uh, so really, many things that does involve dinosaurs, uh, yeah, you know, I, I would be glad to fill that in. And, and uh, because that I did speak with Mary Schweitzer about her work itself, maybe... Uh, Maybe if you do have a spot about that, I would love to fill that in. Or, 
We we even could do one about flat Earth. It's because of all the flat Earthers I've experienced with, and oh, uh, and, and and it's interesting because flat Earth, uh, Kristen, is actually one of the things that helped me move away from young earth creationism is because when I found out that on day two, there's the firmament and I'm like, Hey, if you really want to take Genesis that literally, then the earth is flat. And I'm like, I ain't going to be like those guys. <laughs> Ooh, speaking of which shout out to one of my other favorite Kent Hoven things is that there's a, a, a canopy of ice, three fingers thick <laughs> circling the entire earth. <laughs> That's another favorite God. of mine by him. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. a pretty good one. I, I do need to get a, a quick super chat in. For one ninety nine. we had from Vandalia1998. I'm interviewing an Australian in an hour. And uh, all right, well, if you wanted to see that, go head over to Vandalia1998's oh, channel. Um, so there you go. Little shout out for Vandalia1998, a friend of the channel. Um, let's see. I do have a question for America. Yes. Um, and so uh, I'm just curious, uh, what exact spots do you have like they need to be filled? I, I think we'll, huh? we'll just discuss that off air because we're, we're going yeah, pretty yeah. long on that. So I don't want to yeah, take yeah, up everyone in up, chat's up. time with that. So not, not okay. that it's not a good question, but uh, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Those of you who did, I think we I think we picked somewhere around 70 today for viewers. So that's uh, that's pretty good. Oh, yeah, about. Awesome. yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Um, like I said, next up is uh, Eric with Erica on my channel. It'll be Tuesday at 5 Pacific, 8 Eastern. There you go. Sorry, I had to remember the time. All right, well, bye, everybody. Unfortunately, I would join.